Hello, 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 welcome, 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 it's Fox, from emodels.co.uk, I had to think then, but I was about to say, not one of my normal streams, hey everyone, it's Fox, from emodels.co.uk, your one-stop shop for all your model making needs, welcome one and all, it is 2pm on a, what day is it today, I don't even know what day, is it Thursday or Wednesday, hang on, it's Wednesday, I thought it was, I didn't know if it was, th I've got a message as well, hang on, <sighs> there we go, yes it was fine Mike, um, yeah, I, I thought it was Thursday. I don't even know what day it is. <sighs> Hello, everyone. Welcome. I hope you can hear me and see me okay. Welcome, welcome. Uh, welcome to this little stream. Uh, it is, if you remember, I am working on the big Bandai Perfect Grade 170 second scale. <laughs> Guthorm's been on the gin already. There you go. Guthorm's here. Uh, I'm working on this free models, uh, and I'm doing a video build, but I'm at the point now where I'm just building stuff, so I thought, why not just do a live stream or two? Because it's less boring than just sitting there doing it myself. There's not much I can film. Uh, and I'll explain all that in a moment. But hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. This is, of course, an emodels.co.uk uh, e stream on their channel. So it is family-friendly, so please don't swear. Please don't do any swears. And also, please don't discuss other retailers in the chat. Obviously, this is their chat. Uh, now, let's have a look and see. We'll have a very, very quick look. Uh, who is in chat before we crack on going uh, i've got the chat here in front of me you can see guthorm of course is the chat monster guthorm is my regular chat monster he always keeps an eye on the chat for me i'll just move that there um so i've got the chat here if you want to as with any e-model show you can see the chat there as well but if you uh if you want to get my attention because i will have it here please put your comment in big fat capital letters if you want you can do a super chat but you comment in a color box uh, but if not just stick it in capital letters i'll have a I'll have a quick look and see uh, now I won't have everybody in chat because I've only been in chat for 15 or 20 minutes uh, I'm going to move that because that's at a funny angle and it's just OCD is making it. it doesn't look right when everything else is vertical and horizontal and that's just there you go that's more that's more normal that's we'll just leave it there you look after that go for uh, now I haven't got everybody let's have a quick look and see we've got uh, model making mayhem sprue and glue model making mayhem the raging model Christopher C uh, we have Quano Man, uh, model making trucker. Hi, Lewis, Scaly Models. Dad is one of your mods, as is Paul at Team Inept and Chris at Gross Models. They're all three of your moderators. Uh, they are lovely, fluffy, delicate little squishy forest animals with big, big puppy dog eyes, and they'll keep you safe. And they're dead sweet and gentle, unless you cross them, in which case the ban hammer will come out and you'll never see daylight again. So don't cross the mods. Uh, Sprue Glue is in. Hi, Mr. and Mrs. Fox. Mrs. Fox? Yeah. It's a terrifying thought. Uh, Team Inept, uh, that's Paul. Uh, we have the Raging Model we've done. Brian Wimmel is in. Welcome, Brian. Where's Dave Cardboard? Uh, we have Phil Lewis, uh, who is chatting on the tablet, but watching on the big telly downstairs. Big telly. Hello, big telly. 
Kevin Reynolds, Cy Reynolds is in. Welcome, dude. Uh, Patrick Stachewski is in and subscribing to everybody. So thank you on behalf of me and everybody for, that you're subscribing to everybody, Patrick. Very kind of you. Carl at Making Models is in. It feels like I'm waiting for QVC to start. Well, oh, you give me flashbacks now to Mama Fox buying loads of trash off QVC all those years ago. It was the worst thing we ever did when we got cable TV in the 90s. It was like, oh, there's a shopping channel. Oh. And now in later life, of course, I regret showing Mama Fox Amazon. Yeah. We've got a garden full of resin animals. She, that's what happens. When you expose uh, the older generation to things like Amazon, it all never ends well. Uh, we have uh, Gary G is in. Welcome, Gary G. Red Len 08. Welcome, Red Len. Uh, we have uh, Donald McKenzie. Hi, guys. Welcome, Donald. Mm -mm -mm. Graham M. Welcome, Graham. Uh, we have. Doo -doo -doo -doo. I think that's everybody, actually. Uh, Donald McKenzie. Graham M. Who am I, UK? Afternoon, all. Afternoon, Fox. Welcome, who am I? That's everybody, I think. If I missed you off, I do apologise. Right, let's crack on. So it's going to be, a, I don't know how long I'll go for. Uh, theoretically, I could, my thing's not lined up. Hang on, I've got to straighten my ends out now. What's not straight? Hang on. I've got to do this. I'm really... There, it's better. It's not perfect, but it's better. Um, yes, it's, I don't know how long I'll go on for. It's two o'clock now, five past two. I could go on till six o'clock. I might go until three o'clock. I don't know. Four o'clock. I don't know yet. We'll see how it goes. Uh, but yes, if you remember, I am building the Bandai Perfect Grade 172nd uh, limited edition version Falcon 4 emodels.co.uk. Uh, and so far I've built the cockpit tube, which is over there. You can't see. I'll, I'll, go, I'll grab it. Why don't I just grab it? I've roughly assembled the cockpit tube. Uh, I've not done any painting yet or any permanent affixation of parts. My plan is um, to get the majority of this built up. Uh, into all the sub-assemblies I can do. Now, my memory and experience is building fine moulds of Millennium Falcons, so I'm learning what I can do with it, because this is a push-fit kit. So I'm getting bits built up. I've built the cockpit tube, which I'll always take apart again when I paint. Uh, I've built that so far, uh, and I'm going to get the majority of the, the main hull built up before we do any kind of painting, because a lot of this is it's all push-fit, and a lot of this I can assemble together and just have it ready, and then we can do all the painting. Because the thing with the Millennium Falcon is... It's a complicated build, but it's a really, really easy paint job. Aside from the cockpit, it's kind of all one colour, and it's mostly weathering. So the Falcon is not a complicated paint job. I will be doing proper filming of the of the, the cockpit, obviously. I'll put that cockpit of the um of the cockpit, of the paint job and the weathering and everything else. Now I did start filming episode three, and for episode three, I started doing time lapse photography of building, because I knew it was gonna be a lot of just assembling stuff. There's nothing to talk about. I don't need to explain how to put one piece inside another piece. It's not complicated. There'll be some bits I'll explain as I go along. And I was filming that and I thought, you know what? 20 minutes of just time-lapse assembly with music over the top is really boring. Why don't I just live stream this part? The bit where I'm going to be doing any building, I'll just live stream it. Because that way it'll take a lot longer anyway. But uh, it's it's more fun. It's more, it's more I get company of you guys and you guys get to hang out in the chat with each other. So why don't I do that rather than doing a time-lapse video? So this will technically, this and any future live streams while we're doing the build will be episode three onwards. Once that's done, we can now start doing proper filming of the, the paint jobs. Um, so this might not be the only one. There'll probably be more of these. I'm going to have a big swig of coffee. I do have my enormous cup of coffee, of course, to keep me going. Uh, and I'm just working my way through. I have done, uh, I've done the cockpit part. I've not installed the lighting. Because uh, it's going to come back apart again. I'm building the right mandible. And I've put all the, the little maintenance pits together. Uh, and I've just got to build the actual mandible part now. Now this is a slow build. Because uh, it's lots and lots of tiny, tiny parts. I need to put that there. Tiny, tiny parts. Uh, and lots of very delicate parts. You can see here I've got this sprue here. I is still in the plastic wrap. I've taken a few pieces off. This is all tiny, tiny tubes and pipes. And yeah, I don't want to break any of these. So they're kept in the plastic sleeve and kept to one side. Because there's a few of these sprues and they're super delicate. Yeah, right, let's have a look. So I've done the uh, the maintenance pits. Let's have a quick look. We're going to be building the actual manual, the uh, mandible housing. And sticking some greebles on but like i said the beauty of the falcon is it's a it's, it's a fiddly build but a simple paint job and the majority of any any falcon kit you make 
the majority of it, you can build it before you paint it. So all the little greebles that go on the hull, I can get all them on before I paint it. And what I am doing, it is a Bandai kit, so it is push fit. There's no glue required at all. However, I'm gluing everything uh, because I need, some parts, I need some parts now, don't I? Uh, I need sea spray because obviously I'm going to be painting it once it's all assembled. I don't want little greebles falling off. But also, it's going back to e-models once it's finished. And that's going to be put in a box and packed up and shipped to them. Or I'm going to take it to them if the world's not on fire by that point. So I can't risk bits falling off. So as a precaution, because it's being shipped to e-models and I'm not keeping it, I am gluing everything. Not every single thing, but as much as possible will be glued. Now I've got bits of dust on here, so I'm going to just quickly dust these. Uh, right, so we need uh, all of these parts, basically. C2 and C1. So we have C2 and C1. C2 is the, is the big hollowed one and C1 is the top cover. Let's get these off. So I hope you're all uh, well and good. Paul wants to know if I've got anything exciting in the post recently. As Paul well knows, uh, I'm actually in the, in the process of editing a mailbag video, which I filmed just before we went live. And yes, I did receive something in the post and there's a very short, very silly mailbag video going up on my channel later on today. Yes. Basically, I received a package through the post and I didn't I didn't know what it was. I wasn't expecting it. So I said to my little group of friends, hey, guys, did any of you send me a package in the post? And they all went, no, no, it wasn't me. No. And Paul was like, Paul at Team Annette was like, no, it wasn't me. I didn't send you anything. So the moment he says it wasn't him, I obviously instinctively know it was him. Uh, there's a sprue I can get rid of. Excellent. I should put that down there. Uh, I'll just double check that because you never know. It could be a tiny part. Let's just double check. No parts. Yes. So at the moment, Paul, the team inept, says it was not me. I have nothing to do with it. I instantly know it's Paul. But I wasn't 100% sure. And then about two hours later, he said, have you opened that package yet? And that's the moment I knew it was it was Paul. Uh, right. So we're going to get these bits. We need those two parts. We put this. I've got a little tin. I'm about to break into Pam Air's there. Oh, you got this little mini. It really is quite cute. Little tin for little parts. There you go. Keeps it safe. So we've got those bits there. I'll just move the instructions over there. So we've got these two parts here. We need uh, W15 sprue. Now, what I tend to do when I do Bandai kits, all the sprues are lettered and numbered. What I'll do is I'll break the instructions down into steps like left mandible, right mandible, this bit that bit I'll, and i'll i'll just get the sprues that i need for that step so you can see here i've, I've written down i've checked before and i need sprues d i c and w and when we finish this mandible i'll put those sprues back and i'll get the next set of sprues which will be uh, u e i b and w so i like to do that so i've got the little three or four sprues that i need here in front of me uh, and if we get this bit done i'll go and dig in some more that's not exciting you i'll be off camera going i can't find it uh, w15 is what i want yeah, so I did have a package. I am filming that. It, it has been filmed. Uh, and it will be up later on today. I'm trying something new today as well, by the way. Uh, do let me know. I've, I'm trying, I've tried it in the video that was filming today, and I'm trying it on this live stream. Um, let me know what you think of the picture quality and the, the movement. If everything's, you know, shonky and wobbly, or is it all nice and clear? Because I was doing some learning last night. I was reading the words and things. Uh, and it's never a good idea for me to try and read words and learn things, but uh, well, that it's got schmutz in it. Why has it got schmutz in it? Get out! Uh, and I was reading about filming at twenty-four frames a second. Now, I, I might. This is where my father will be violently oscillating in his in his urn, because my father, for his entire life, was a television cameraman. And I have zero knowledge of cameras. I just no idea. Exposure and focal length. I just no idea. My dad will be like sitting there going, oh, for Lord, oh, God. Uh, so I was reading up last night. Uh, and I thought to myself, you know what? I'm going to I'm gonna look for this part here. D, I need D sprue, not that one. Uh, I thought, you know what? I'm going to try something. 
I'm going to try and do learning. So what I did was I've done some filming today and I've normally when you when I film video for most of you who film video, especially if you use a smartphone, if you've got your own YouTube channel or whatever you do, uh, you'll tend to just use whatever default settings are with a few little tweaks. So if you're filming at, say, 1080p, you're, if you're, especially if you're using a smartphone to film, because the smartphones are brilliant. The cameras on smartphones nowadays are just fantastic. You're probably filming at 1080p, uh, and you're probably, therefore, filming at 30 frames a second. However, I want D32 and D9. Uh, D9 is that one. However, uh, I was reading today, I've, I've, I've always been aware that like motion, you know, film, proper film production uses 24 frames a second. And 30 frames a second is more of a, an artifact of digital and video. And I thought to myself, I was reading up and it was saying when you, you know, you film in 24 frames a second, you, uh, you increase the f-stop, I think, I don't understand this, and you increase other things. And it basically means you've got less frames per second, you get more light. Now lighting is always a problem when you're filming anything for YouTube. D32 is that one. Uh, especially if you're using a smartphone. Smartphones aren't the best. They're not big, you know, $70,000 red cameras that can film at night in the depths of space. But So you always want lots and lots of light. And it's always been a boondoggle of mine to try and get decent lighting and images and stuff when I'm filming. Uh, and I thought to myself, I'll try and experiment. I will. I'll just get those parts for now. I will. Film at 24 frames a second because I've got an app on I've got a camera app that allows me to frame at 24 frames a second. I'll film at 24 frames a second, so that means I get less frames. The shutter's open for longer. I double the shutter speed, or rather, I, I change the shutter speed. Uh, I get more light, and it might lead to smoother video and smoother movements. So I tried some today. I was filming at 24 frames a second with an f with a shutter speed of 1 48th. If that's how you pronounce it. I don't know how you pronounce it. 1 slash 48. Because uh, apparently there's a rule called the 180 rule. The 180 degree rule. <clears throat> Whatever your um, frame rate is. You have to multiply that by 2. And that's your shutter speed. So theoretically. 30 frames a second should be 60. 1, 1 60th. Which means basically. If you're filming at 30 frames a second. The shutter is open for 1 60th of a second. Each time it's open. If you're filming at one at uh, 24 frames a second uh, your shutter is open for 1 48th of a second so it open for longer and therefore it lets more light in which means it, your, your video might come out better and because it's uh because your your shutter is open for longer you can drop the exposure down a bit because you're getting more light and exposure on digital cameras is always something that kills you kills your frame rate and gives chop and nastiness uh, but anyway, so I've been doing an experiment today. It's all very inside baseball, but I've done an experiment today to film at 24 frames a second with a, a different uh, shutter speed, different exposure, uh, and it seems to look quite nice. It, it has allowed me to get better light to the camera. I don't like cutting this bit off with this, but there we go. Uh, so we'll see how it goes. But uh, today I am streaming right now at 24 frames a second. Again, because it's a crappy web, it's not a crappy webcam, it's a webcam. Webcams are not the best. Uh, my theory is hopefully, again, uh, lower frame rate means, means, first of all, less data I'm sending through the interwebs. So less chance of the frame of the stream falling over. Uh, but also, it means less data means less compression. So maybe it'll look a bit better, less compression artifacts. And also, it means I can get a bit more light into the camera. So this might look a bit brighter and less less gloomy because often live streams look gloomy when i film them because i've only got so many lights so that's my experiment anyway i'm trying it let me know how it looks how it goes it might be garbage i don't know but uh i thought i'd give it a try all right let's just get these nubs off now i don't know how much we'll get done today it is like i say a push fit build if you've never built a bandai kit here we go if you if you're a traditional model maker, this is remember this is I've just dropped a bit of sprue and it's going to stick in my foot at some point. If you've never made a Bandai kit before, if you're the kind of person that makes you know proper model kits, glue kits and stuff, uh, and you've never tried a Bandai kit before, uh, then if you you should do, you're in for a treat. Basically, here's how it works. If you're if you're a traditional model maker, 
uh, you may well have a, a certain view of push fit kits and by push fit i mean what Ravel would call snap fit but i don't like the word snap it's a bit violent and a bit negative when something snaps on the model it's not a good thing um you may have a particularly bad view of push fit kits because for the most part by and large the kits you will be exposed to if you've never even seen a bandai kit before the, the kits you will be will have been exposed to that have been push fit or snap fit <coughs> have been for the most part pretty much garbage it's never been something that anybody's done very well apart from bandai uh, bandai do a mate i need my my spells help space helmet of seeing now now if this keeps coming in the shot all the time my little visor do let me know i don't know i can't tell so um yeah if you if you if you experiences of that then you you may think badly of push fit kits and just dismiss them as children's toys because traditionally push fit kits have always been not particularly great quality they've been a bit simple they've lacked detail they've been aimed at the younger beginner builder type of scenario you know you, you get the idea however bandai kits don't do that at all uh, Bandai's push fit kits are just divine. They are absolutely divine. They are beautifully engineered. Uh, they go together like a dream. I've always maintained that Bandai have, in my opinion, remember, my opinion, remember, in my opinion, the absolute finest engineering and molding of any model, model manufacturer. They put everybody to shame. Because not only are they making beautiful kits that look fantastic, loads and loads of detail. They also have to engineer them so that they fit together perfectly without any need for glue. So, here's my thing. If you've never tried a Bandai kit and you're a dyed-in-the-wool traditional model maker, I would suggest you maybe check out... Uh, some of their Star Wars kits, some of their Star Wars models. Because it's a more traditional subject matter that you might be familiar with. Uh, but it is just a fine build uh, experience. Like, for example, this kit here, this is this Millennium Falcon kit. It's a push fit kit, but it's got, I don't know how many parts it has, but, you know, there's over... There's like 70 parts in that, and that's just two of the maintenance pits on a mandible. There's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of parts in this. I think this may actually have more parts than the legendary fine moulds Millennium Falcon from all those years ago, which was a traditional glue kit. Uh, it's also the most accurate Millennium Falcon model that there is. And that's it really so yeah if you've never tried one i do recommend go and check one out now i know the guys at e-models they were awaiting some restocking of bandai star wars stuff uh just before the entire world caught fire so i'm not sure what's in stock at the moment it's probably quite a fair bit but uh they did have things like the they had the at at they had the atst they did they have the ATAT? yeah they had the at at the atst they had this falcon uh, they had snow speed and X-Wing and stuff like that. So go and have a look. Check them out. There's also a Gumpler section, which is Bandai do Gumpler. So check that out as well. But yeah, if you've never tried one and you have this view of snap fit and push fit kits as garbage for kids, I do recommend you try one. You, 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 hopefully you will discover it is a complete and utter treat. And in a minute, I'll show you something that is a good example of how accurate their kits can be when i've cleaned up these parts i'll show you something that may blow if you're if you're an older mate a builder like me and you remember your old airfix days you're about to see something that may ring a bell uh, where's all the nubs At the moment i'm just getting rid of all the nubs shaving all these off and scraping them down get it all nice and smooth let's go in with the nippers for those there we go little bit of that you see there, not that, lovely. 
Uh, I will check the comments in a moment as well. Now, I do apologise if I'm not as responsive to you guys in comments as, as I usually am. If you watch my own streams, I spend all three, four hours chatting to you guys and saying nothing and doing no work. But this, of course, is a build 40 model, so I can't really sit back and do nothing. The whole point of this is I want to get this build done and painted. Uh, and I'd rather do it with your company than sit on my own. So... We will be getting some, so I might be a little bit less responsive than normal to the chat because I'm going to spend a lot of time actually just focusing on the build at hand. Uh, right now, here's an example. Now, I don't know if I can zoom in all the way because my camera decided recently it doesn't only zoom a little bit, so I didn't go zoom that far. Right, here's uh, one of the inside parts of one of the mandibles, and I don't know if this will come out on camera because I can't, I can't zoom in and I can't change the focus. Looks unremarkable, you might think. However, when I saw this, this bit here, flat peaks with two sort of raised bits in the middle, the first thing I saw and the first thing I thought was that looks just like that old vintage 1970s Airfix pontoon bridge kit, the flat bit that's the base of the bridge. And then I did some research and on the actual Studio Millennium Falcon, this bit was the bit from the pontoon bridge kit. Bandai have, big, have, have very, very carefully and very accurately reproduced everything on the studio model that they had as a reference to the point that you can actually identify kit parts. That is indeed, with a little bit of modification, that is indeed a miniaturized replica of the part on the model, this film model, the studio model, which is in turn the floor panels for the Airfix pontoon bridge. And I was like, whoa! Because I've, I've built a number of Falcons over the years and 99% of them are garbage and don't look anything like the, mod, the filming models. The Fine Moulds one was the most accurate up to that point and it was very, very good, but I never made that association. But this one, I saw that and thought, that's the pontoon bridge. It's even got the little dividing lines. So as we go through, I'm sure I'll find things. I can see here, I don't know what it's from, but here, this looks like the chassis of a truck. I can see there's an engine block there. Uh, there's some exhaust tubing. Uh, there's radiator, but there's other greebles stuck in there as well. But the sign of an accurate reproduction of a filming miniature is that you can look at the model you're making and see the greebles that the studio modelers would have stuck on their kit because they just, you know, stick kit parts on. And the Falcon's legendary of having like, you know, King Tigers and Panzer Fours and all kinds of bits and bobs. So there's lots of different things. If you, if you get one of these models yourselves, you'll go through and be like, I know that bit, I recognise that, and that's this and that. It's amazing. So yeah, there you go. That's how accurate these puppies are. Little aside there for you. <clears throat> if you've never tried a push fit kit, I cannot recommend Bandai stuff enough just to change to try and change your mind. You might still hate them, but for someone like me, who I prefer the paint and not the, the build, I'm a painter, not a builder. For someone like me, they're really good because, like I say, I don't, I, I'll prefer the paint to the. I can't, I can't get this and go for me right in the way there. I prefer the build of uh, the paint to the build. And so the pe the building doesn't interest me as much as the painting. So, right, go for You go over there for a minute because you're in the wrong place there, lad. You sit there for a minute. There you go. So for something like this, which is the build is brain free. You don't need to think with this build. Very well. I'll have to do a bit of thinking for the lighting when I set the lighting up. But for most of it, I'm not going to have to do any thinkage at all. It's a it's a godsend manner from heaven for me because I can spend all my time focusing on the actual paint job anyway moving on how is everyone I hope you're all well hope you're all doing okay hope you're all safe and well uh, I'm having a jolly good time I don't know if dad's already asked the question because I've not looked at chat so I will ask the question just in case if dad hasn't I'm sure he already has. Uh, the traditional question, which is, of course, bench and belly. What's on your bench? What are you working on right now? What models do you have on the go? And not just models. It could be anything. You could be drawing a picture. You could be painting a painting. You could be making something out of casting something out of resin. You could be building a shelving unit out of wood. It could be anything. What are you working on? What are you creatively crafting right now? And what's in your belly? What are you having for your dinner later on? Or what have you had for your dinner? Or you can say what you've had for your lunch, if you've had your lunch. 
And remember, we're more interested in the actual food side of that, the belly side of that, than we are the actual bench side of it. So we want all the information on the uh, belly, but just give us the basics on the bench. <laughs> Excuse me. Now, if you've stumbled across this uh, stream accidentally and you're not familiar with e-models, just very, very quickly, because this is an e-model stream and I'm duty bound to obviously pimp their shizzle, because that's what I do. <clears throat> uh, this is an e-models build. Uh, E-Models are the UK's largest online retailer of model and hobby goodness. So if you've never been there before, uh, go to emodels.co.uk. It's just there. In the, you can't see it. It's just there. You can see it there. Emodels.co.uk. Uh, they have a huge stock of all the things in the universe. Uh, and there's a golden rule. If they haven't got it, you don't need it. But if you do need it, and they haven't got it, because they've, they've probably got something else just as good, or better. Um, but in the unlikely event you need something and they haven't got it, you drop them a line and they can probably get it for you. Uh, they're the UK's largest stockist of Tamiya. Just so you know. Uh, they also do remote control stuff. And pretty much anything you would need for your scale modelling shenaniganery. Shenaniganery, that's not a real word, I know. So do go and check them out. Don't forget, of course, uh, there is the new reward points, e-reward points scheme, which launched this week. Uh, and what that means is every time you place an order, every time you order something from e-models, uh, every item in store uh, gives you X amount of points. And you can build those points up on your account. And when you think you've got enough for the thing you want to buy, you can use them to buy stuff you can put it towards whatever you're buying or you can save them up to get enough to get yourself a model for free so for example if there's a particular model you're looking for but you know it's going to be one of those like big expensive kits that when that turns up on the doorstep your your better half is going to look at you with that kind of side eye and you're going to be like oh i'm in trouble now then don't panic because why not just order all your normal stuff like you normally do that you can get away with and then eventually you'll have enough points that you can then use them in their entirety to order that thing that you've been after. And then you can legitimately say to your better half, it costs me nothing at all. Because that will be true. Uh, you need to be so make sure if you do go and shop in the shop, shop in the shop, let me, hang on, coffee, words aren't working, hang on. Yeah. If you do uh, go and order stuff, make sure to register. If you're not already registered, make sure to get yourself a account. Register. Wow. Hang on. More coffee. Still words not working. Brain words failing. Let's try all that again. Make sure to register. Get yourself an account. Because uh, you need an account because it, it puts the points on your account. So there you go. If you just shop as a guest, there's nowhere for the points to go and they'll sit there. And they are the finest points available. E models only supply you with the finest imaginary space coins for your account. They don't give you any old garbage points. They are the finest imaginary space coins you can ever come across. Right. So, this needs to be assembled. Let's show you how this Bandai chisel works. Before I do, I'll have a quick look at the chat and see what's been happening. Oh, the cartoon fox looks lonely. Wait, what? Oh, that one down there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this stream needs more collie. No, says Team Inept. Uh, where are we? Flying Hamburger Time, says Model Making Mayhem. Uh, is this to keep the actual episode count to six? Uh, no, not at all. There may be... Well, I can, all I will say is the final episode of this build series will be episode six. Uh, do I'm a subscriber to your channel, eModels, says Patrick. Thank you very much. I want to buy some things from the web. eModels.co.uk is where you want to go. Uh, oh, do keep in mind as well. <clears throat> I'll, I'll update you in a minute about the uh, the stuff. So uh, ignore what I just said. Uh, what's happening in chat? Very, very quick look. Oh, and chat's vanished. There we go. 
do 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 chat jumped and I missed. I think it just updated itself. Brilliant. Buffering alert. Don't like buffering. I've had no drop frames. That could be something at your end or YouTube. Uh, so Reynolds says it's hard to tell on the stream about the 24 frames a second. Latency may not translate to any changes you make. Well, it might not work necessarily for the for the live stream. It'll definitely have some benefits for the pre-recorded content. But I thought I'd give it a try. It means I'm. It, it'll probably still look fine, and it means I'm sending less data, and therefore my computer's not. In fact, my computer's actually quite quiet because normally my fan's screaming at me. But it seems to be having a bit of a happier time processing the video and sending it up. So it's, it's doing me some benefits. I can't hear my fan screaming. As long as it looks all right and it isn't all like eh, 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 like that. As long as it's not like framey like that, then I'll stick it 24 frames a second. Yeah. Uh, but I'm not showing any lost frames, so buffering's at your end. Uh, Scott Sutherland is in. I think I've missed a lot of people coming in. I do apologise. Uh, what's in your bench and what's in your de belly, says Dad. Uh, Sir Reynolds says, the baby of this kit, the 144 Falcon, belly too many Harry boat. Raging Model has his young blue dragon, so I'm kind of trying to get a Dernan. He's still doing this Dungeons and Dragons thing that makes no sense to me. I have my young blue dragon, so I'm kind of trying to get Dernan and the red dragon wormling done, belly nothing. None of those words make any sense to me. Uh, now in the belly, pin washing the Bandai X Wing, says Ian Thompson. Welcome in. Troughton Chard is on his, working on his Polar Lights 1350 Enterprise and a Katinga, belly full of tea and Viennese whirl. Viennese whirls. That's very civilized. I would like Viennese whirl, please. Most kind. Uh, belly sausage rolls and beans, says Scott Sutherland. And bench Ryfield model MATV. Israeli Defence Force, by any chance? Uh, uh, Don McKenzie uh, says, so Don, I said Don, it's Donald, Donald McKenzie. Just shortened your name then, for no reason whatsoever. Belly scrambled egg roll with brown sauce. Oh yeah, Trump factory. Bench a kit from series four, that's from Knight Rider. Red Lens got belly croissant and strawberry jam. Bench is a plague burst crawler, nice. Watch out for the spikies. How many points for a Titanic, lol? A number. Uh, Quantum Man says belly coding and coffee and bench drool because I'm smashed on happy pills. Well, hey, yes, he's on his uh, painkillers at the minute. Sam Reynolds, I feel the Mrs. Side Eye comment was directed at me, Fox. Nope, it was everybody because it might be Mr. Side Eye, you know, it's who knows. Uh, Graham M says working on a 132nd BF 109 G6, but it's on hold because his airbrush is busted and pasta later. You can't just say pasta, just in case anybody's new. You can't just say pasta or pizza or whatever. You've got we want all the details because the model making bit isn't really the important bit. The important bit is the food. We want to eat dinner vicarious. I'm stuck here for three hours or four hours, whatever. I want to I want to be ravenously hungry by the time I finish so I can eat all my tea and just eat anything that moves. So I'm I'm living vicariously. Eating vicariously through your descriptions. I wish Airfix made more BF109 variants, uh, G variants. Uh, asks, says Patrick, if Wingnut Wings open back up. Unfortunately, Wingnut Wings is gone. Wingnut Wings no longer exist, sadly. It's, there'll be no new kits from Wingnut Wings. They are out of business and closed. Bench Custom Fire Slayers, says Team Annette. Belly, leftover curry all mixed together into a melange. Melange? Uh, I read meringue initially, Paul, and recoiled. <laughs> leftover curry all mixed together into a meringue. That would be a bit... A bit uh, not good. No US Arm Army Fox, says Scott. <gasps> You're making a vehicle that's not Israeli Defence Force. It's, it's Something's wrong with the world there. Uh, Patrick says, E models, I please read this. I might be getting an Airfix 148 Stuka. Cool. I don't know if they have one in stock. Keep in mind, by the way, that myself and Ted and Colin and Chris, we don't actually work for E models. We just help them out and do videos and live streams and stuff. Uh, we work with them, but we're not actually on the payroll and we don't work at the, at the, at the, you know, the warehouse. So we don't know what they have in stock and things like that. So if there is something and you can't find it, if you have to say a 148 Stuka, uh, and they haven't got one, just drop them an email. If they haven't got one in stock, it may just be it's temporarily out. If you can't find something on the website, it might just be it's temporarily out of stock, in which case it'll be back soon. 
Or it might be something they don't normally carry, but if that's the case, they can probably still get it from one of their distributors. So if ever you can't find something and there's something you really want, like a 148 Stuka, drop say, hey guys, can you pick up whatever kit? And they'll be like, yeah, no problem. However, do keep in mind at the moment, obviously, <coughs> because of the chop chocolate Velociraptor Panda Moomin, which is the code language for the fact the world is entirely on fire, but we want to keep this video monetized. Thank you very much. Um, E-models have remained open for online orders throughout the whole scenario. They didn't have to close. But they did get like a batrillion orders right at the start. So they're still working their way through all the orders and making sure everybody gets what they've ordered. But please do be patient. Uh, when it comes to how quickly your order is fulfilled and sent to you, it may potentially take a little bit longer than normal. So please don't be... If you place an order, please don't then send a follow-up email chasing it to find out where it's gone. Uh, because they will be doing their best to get through it right now. Uh, but there may be some slight delay. It may take a little bit longer. Right, this needs to go on here, like the actual say. Snicked, and that's in. And that needs to... And, and I don't need to glue this, but I am going to glue this. Again, purely because I don't want greebles falling off once I've painted it. You don't need to do this. If you're just building this yourself for your own cabinet and you're going to build and paint it, you do not need to glue anything. I'm just doing this because I'm going to be sending it to e-models and I don't want all the bits to fall off. So that can go in there. This needs to go on that side. That's that one and then there. So we'll leave that there for a second to cure. This needs to go on this side. Like that, you see? Nice and simple. Simple and nice. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so uh, do do allow for, you know, it might might take a little, it might not, you might get your order as normal, but it might take a little bit longer just because they have to have a massive amount of orders to send out. And of course, they're working on limited staffing numbers because even though they're open, or for a long time when they're open, they had to adhere to you know the legal requirements for health and safety for under the situation right now so um it's not necessarily the case that we'll be working at full strength so do be patient give them a chance that goes there beep, 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 beep. looking like a mandible now I'm looking like a mandible now now got some instructions here uh if you're building this yourself uh, i'll see if i can shall i stay zoomed in I'm still zoomed. I'm still zoomed in. Okay, never mind. Uh, if you see, if you're building a Bandai kit or you're building this kit or the other Falcon kit, uh, the non-limited edition one, you'll see every now and then those little bunny ears on instructions where it's got little tick marks. That's just a way to say, hey, pay attention. This bit needs to be this way around. Uh, so like on that piece there, there's little sort of greebles on the on the side of it. It says, hey, pay attention. The greebles need to be on that end. So just need to make sure I've got this the right way around, which is. Uh, that way I think yes now this piece here the classic bit that goes on the front of the mandible if you know your vehicles it looks like the engine block from a tank of some sort perhaps <laughs> which is probably exactly what it is just to go on there there's a peg for that to go in oh, shall I put the other oh, I might just put the other side piece on first actually get that bit on first now i am going slowly with this if you if you if you've built one of these and you're sitting there going oh for god you haven't finished by now fox keep in mind i am taking my time like nobody's business it is essentially a commission build because i'm building it free models so i'm taking my time i'm not rushing it i'm not diving in and just slamming things in willy-nilly so yes the build will be slow plus i'm also talking to you guys while i'm building which uh, doesn't help so that needs to go on there, and then this piece goes here, like there, does it? Now, they, they do put this little tick mark here to say, make sure this piece goes this way around. But in reality, it can't not go that way because you've got a slot on a peg, and there's a there's a hole, and there's a slot. So you can't actually get it the wrong way around anyway. Not unless you're extra special and somehow managed to completely mess it up. But yeah, you can't really mess it up. You watch, I'll mess it up now. <laughs> yeah right so that bit goes on there 
Now what I'm going to do, I'm not going to glue any of these parts in just yet until I've got all the bits on and I'm about to put the top piece on because then I can glue everything into place then. Just in case I need to discombobulate it. Uh, so that's that bit. Put them to one side. Um, there. Is that, is that set up? I believe it's there. Uh, Phil Lewis says, e model is doing a great job under challenging circumstances. Well done all. Uh, Patrick says, RIP wingnut wings. It is a shame. I did always say that at some point I would probably get round to doing a wingnut biplane or something or a kit like that because they do make they did make fantastic kits. It was a Peter Jackson pet project. Um, yeah, Peter Jackson from Weta Workshop. But unfortunately, it just turned out that they were. It was not a financially viable business, unfortunately. Sadly, I guess. Uh, they were obviously they spent a lot of money, invested a lot of money and time into making these wonderful kits. It wasn't reflected in the sales, I guess. Uh, D29 and D31. D29, sorry, knocking the camera. Uh, no 135th Lancaster then from Wing Nuts. Uh, I suspect not. Now, it might be that somebody buys the toolings. You don't know how far in advance that project actually got. 29, 31. 29's there. Uh, you don't know how far in advance that project actually got. So it may well be they got close to completion and it might well be that there's a, there's a tool for it. They actually got to the point of making the moulds. So it may be that somebody comes along and buys the toolings. It's not impossible. Likely. D29, which is... Oh, there's D31, which is that bit. Now these are tiny little parts and I would... In fact, I'm going to. I normally say, if you ever watch my stuff, you know I always say never take parts off the sprue with uh, your expensive god hand nippers or your expensive Zurons or any expensive nippers. However, these parts are so small and tiny and the actual gates are so thin that I can just about get away with it. Just about. I would not cut parts off a Games Workshop sprue with these god hand nippers because they'd just be exploded. But these are so small and so delicate, so soft. This plastic's quite soft, so I can get away with it. Right, I'll put them out of the way. Uh, so we need to clean these parts up. Uh, why do Wingnut Wings close down? Again, I, I, I assume it's because they it was it just it didn't work. They were selling exceptionally high-end kits, but maybe just didn't get the sales. Uh, I need them again now, don't I? Also, the current current you know economic situation is probably not great uh, with you know chocolate Velociraptor and other things. And it was only a pet project from Peter Jackson. It wasn't like let's make this company the best. He was it was kind of done as a a pet project for him really. So it's a shame. Like I say, maybe they just didn't it didn't survive financially. Maybe there was just no money in it. I mean, you know, it's not it's not like they were a big massive company, they were a small company making top tier products. <laughs> That's the problem, you see, it's the downfall. <coughs> it's precisely the reason why in anything, not just models, but in anything, you always get that you always see a whole ocean of cheap churned out nonsense but the real proper quality stuff is harder to come across costs more and those companies don't tend to survive that's why you get your companies that have the pilot high and sell it cheap so your model companies you know you get the models that are they're not brilliant they're all right they're just kind of cheap and basic but they come out in like locusts they're just like locusts they just endlessly swarm out I want to put that there, didn't I? Mean? There'll never be, a, you'll never not see an endless stream of cheap, clunky kits. But the more expensive ones, like these, yeah, like Trumpeter doing their, uh, you know, one two hundred scale Titanic and their one forty eight scale U boat. Those are huge kits, and they're like four five hundred pounds a pop. Now, if they just made kits like that. If Trumpet had just made 500 pound huge, incredibly detailed kits like that, they got a business in a heartbeat because they might sell a few and everybody would love them, but they wouldn't last long. They wouldn't sell enough to make back the costs of development and the cost of the mold. Uh, whereas 
you know, if they make those kits alongside more traditional regular kits that cost maybe 20 or 30 quid a pop, and they're just the standard kind of fare, then they stay in business. Now, Wingnut, I mean, I don't know for sure. If I'm, if I'm wrong on this, I mean, I'm only working off my barest of memories, but Wingnut just did the sort of expensive, nice stuff, which was not, and they kind of limited themselves to very niche vehicles, like, you know, planes, like biplanes and stuff. It wasn't like they were doing Spitfires and Tornadoes and things like that. The stuff that sells in bulk. So I think they were just, uh, it's just the way it is. That's why you always get this endless sea of dross, but with a few diamonds in the rough. It's selling the, the sort of the generic stuff that allows companies to do the nice stuff every now and then. That's the way of the world. I could be wrong, but that's my understanding of it anyway. <clears throat> now this bit on the Millennium Falcon. Now I could have this wrong. I always get this wrong, but I can never. But if if you look at your Studio Millennium Falcon, remember I'm saying about the use like greebles and, and cash, uh, scratch built or uh, kit bash parts. If you look at this bit on Millennium Falcon, you might look at that and think it looks like half an engine. That's because it's half an engine. It's an engine block from I think a one twelfth scale Porsche Carrera. I could be wrong, but my understanding was I think on the filming model. They actually had in their stash of all the kits in the world. They went to the local model shop and bought every single Tamiya kit they could find and used them all for parts on the Falcon. My understanding was they had a 112 scale Porsche Carrera vintage 1970s kit. And you'll see this half of the engine and the other half on the other side. I think. Well, it's the transmission or the engine. Some some part of the engine. I don't understand engines, so I could be wrong. But some part of it. I think it might be a, a, a Porsche Carrera. Uh. Mm -hmm, mm -mm -mm. Uh, Graham M says, okay, pasta bake, minced beef, tomatoes, arabiata sauce, onion, garlic, and chili, pour over cool penne pasta and bake. There you go, that's better. Uh, use Tamiya cement, it's a bit more thicker than extra thin. I use extra thin specific, I've got Tamiya cement there. I use this specifically because I want to use as little glue as possible on these tiny, tiny components. I'll use this if I have two big flat things that I need to stick together but this runs into the gaps and it's perfect for anything where you've got tiny tiny parts right so this is going to be how is this going to go together now i need to combobulate these two together first okay this is going to get tricky <coughs> so what Let's see how this goes so i need to get this d29 is that one and uh, this one needs to go, oops, there. So at this point, we're basically putting Lego together at this point. Click, there we go. That's those two pieces together. Now, there's no reason at all those two tiny little components need to be two separate parts. But the fact they are, that's just that's just Bandai quality for you. Uh, now, this needs to go here like that somehow. There we go. Patink, that sits in there. Spoot. Done. Now, again, there's no reason why that bit couldn't have been moulded in. It could have absolutely been moulded in as a, as a single thing. But it wasn't. They kept it separate. Because that's why Bandai are awesome. Right. Okay, so that needs to go on the side. I do 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 do. <clears throat> this needs to go here, like that, you see? This is the bit that sits alongside the cockpit area. Shenanigan. How is this going to attach? It's going to attach like, like that there. It goes on there. That sits in there. Lovely. That's lovely, that is. Oh, yeah. Look at it. It's divine. It goes together with no fuss, no muss, no arguments, no no getting rid of flash, no bits that don't quite fit properly. It just, it just works. To quote Todd Howard, it just works. Except, unlike Bethesda games, it just works. <laughs> mm. 
So that goes there. Not glued anything in yet. Uh, now we need to get my previous construction stations, which is this one here. Uh, chat still going? Has chat died? Are you guys still there? Oh, there we go. Yeah, she's still there. I thought chat had stopped for a minute. Uh, this needs to go in. So we have it needs to be which way around? It needs to be uh, this way around. That needs to be there. Apparently this bit should have gone in first. Ah, uh, well, never mind. I'm sure it'll be fine. This bit sits on here. Click. Satisfying click time. Now, the thing is with these parts. This mandible, both mandibles, when it comes to assembly, I'll have the saucer sections and the mandibles. I'll probably have them separate. I know, just from experience, that I don't need to have these side walls separate to paint them. I can assemble this whole mandible section and paint it. Same on the other side. I can paint that one. Get all the greebles on. Uh, and then I can attach them to the rest of the ship when that's been painted I, when you're doing a bandai kit or any kind of kit like this where you've got the option of taking things back apart again uh, it's always worth just taking time to consider your build order so this now goes on top i know that once this goes on here theoretically i don't have any reason to ever take this off again at all because I don't, I can, I can easily get to all of that for painting, so it's not a biggie. It's no problem. So I can squanch this down quite nicely. He says, struggling a little bit. There we go. Get it on properly. Get it lined up properly. You spoon. Bandai kits go together beautifully, but it doesn't. Unless you're a complete spoon and mess it up, in which case, yeah, that's still not going to go together if you don't line it up properly. There we go. Right, so that's on there. Like a glove. See, I can see there, I know you can't, but I can see there a tiny little greeble, which I know straight away is the Apollo uh, Lunar Lander, or the, or the top of the LEM. So that's obviously... On the real studio model, it says tiny 170 second uh, airfix. I think it was airfix. Uh, Apollo Lunar Lander. Lunar Lander. Right, so what I can do now is make sure that's in place. Get myself some clampy clampy. I don't need to do this. Again, you don't have to glue any of this, but I'm just being extra cautious because this has to be transported. Uh, and it is to sit in E-Model's cabinet and they're going to manhandle it and if bits are falling off they won't know how to fix it because they haven't built it. So I'm not going to make that assumption. I'm going to take a little bit of the uh, extra thin. Now this is why I'm using the extra thin because I can touch it to the gap and it'll use capillary action to suck into that gap and be stuck a -pated. There you go. Lovely. Lovely. Bip. Maybe not a bit too wide for those, but we'll see how it goes. That's on there. We'll do the same on this side. A little bit of capillary action. Caterpillar action. If I did this with the thick glue, it would be a mess of just thick glue everywhere. It'd look like garbage. So, yeah. Always have multiple different gluing solutions in your arsenal. We'll need to do this for long, just five or ten minutes, just to set nicely. Apologies if I'm off camera. Should be setting quite nicely there. We'll get some around these tubes. Just to lock those in. Not much for it to grip on. It might ping off. There may be pingage. There may be pingage ahead. I spotted a nub that I didn't remove. Gosh darn it. Well, I'll get that later. It may actually be hidden inside anyway. It's fine. There's a nub there I forgot to remove, but you're not going to see it. Mm. 
that bit down there is, is invisible. Like the dreaded Bu Bu Goy Goy. It's completely invisible, bro. The dreaded Bu Bu Goy Goy. He'll get you. I can't really get any clamps around that. Get you. Oh, hello. Get your clamps around that then. Do a little bit here. Just down this little gap. And then I shall pause and have a swig of the beverage and also have a chat with you guys. Is that going to stay on? Or is that going to, it's probably going to ping off. We'll, we'll give that five minutes. And there we go. That's fine for the moment. Next is adding all the little greebles that go on the outside. So I shall have a swig of the coffees. Uh, I didn't know there was an Apollo Lem Greeble on the Falcon. I once saw a website that identified a lot of the model kit parts that were used. I'm floored by the detective work that was done. I could be wrong. Uh, it just looks very much. And I'm going off. Obviously, this has been. Hey, I knew there'd be something that pinged off and made me jump. Why are you order? Let me use it. Let me use an alternative combobulation method. There we go. Uh, I'll see if I can zoom. I'll see if I can get close to it and get it on focus. Hang on. Let's see, I'll have to fiddle with the focus a bit, so let's see how close I can go. Where's the focus? There it is. You might not see it, but it's basically, I'm going to get a pointy stick. It's basically that there is a tiny lem. You know the top bit. I'm guessing it's what it looks like to me, and it looks uncannily like a lem. So it just gives you an idea of the real thing, the, the real studio model, how big it actually was. I need to do the focus again now, don't I? Oh, hang on, I need something to focus on. Let me adjust my focus. That's why I don't like changing my focus, you see. There we go. Yeah, near enough. Almost, near almost, wait. And it's only because, it's not because I have any unerring knowledge of any of these things, it's purely because after, you know, only a couple of years since I built the uh, the Eagle Transporter, which had lems all over it, <laughs> I was like, oh, that's a lem, there you go. If it's the lem, is it the command, it might be the command module, I don't know if, which one it is, is that bit, you know, the, the, the one that left the moon and landed and left again. Uh, the Lunar Lander was a popular piece, bits of it popped up on the Eagle Lander too, says Ian. Yep, exactly, that's why I recognise that, because I saw it on my Eagle Transporter. Edward Lander's in. Uh, welcome, Edward. Uh, what's better, Tamiya Extra Thin Cement or Mr. Hobby Mr. Cements? I've never used the Mr. Hobby Cements, but Tamiya Extra Thin is... I've only found one glue... Well, no, I've actually found other glues that are equally as good, but... Yeah, I don't know. I've, no, I've not used the Mr. Hobby ones. But I, I will never not have a water-thin glue. I've got, like, for example, if I'm gluing something that's not polystyrene, I've got plastic magic which is the same kind of thing. It's actually thinner than this, but it's designed for more than just polystyrene. So it works on ABS and stuff like that. So yeah, I've never not got extra thin. I do also have some of the extra thin quick setting. You won't see me use this very often because it stinks. It's the worst smell in the world. It's, oh, it's like, oh, it's like somebody's opened my nose and jammed methyl ethyl ketones in there. It's like, oh, flipping it. So, yeah, this is like, I use this very, very sparingly because it's such a strong, powerful, deadly smell. Oh. Uh, where are we? Paul Di Tommaso says, oh, okay, they're just up taking the land orders for now due to Chocoraptor. Raptor. Is that Wingnut? I heard, I heard that Wingnuts have actually shut down. That the owner said we've actually gone out of business. I could be wrong. If I am wrong, that'd be nice. But I'm sure I read somewhere that somebody said we are now closed. That's it. End of. Not just that we're not taking orders. My little bits fell off my hand. Hang on. I think there's a lot of confusion as to whether they are closed permanently or just shut down for a while. I don't. This, there is some confusion. But my understanding was they'd actually just closed out and gone out of business. But we shall find out. Mm -hmm. Right. Please remember, folks, please don't discuss the uh, current medical situation in chat if you can avoid it, because we'd like to keep this video monetized and not removed off YouTube. Uh, 
So please don't discuss directly any medical advice or current situation if you would mind. So that's doing nicely. I think that's all together. Maybe a little bit more at the front of the schnoz there. Let's do this. I'll do this. I didn't do this bit, did I? Just a touch, just a tiny touch. There we go. I do like the way that some of these plates look like they're sitting slightly off the surface, but that's kind of exactly how the real thing looks. Just bits stuck on here and there. That's kind of what it looks like. Uh, right, now we need some lots of tiny, tiny greebles, so I shall get these off the sprue. I'll put that over there for the moment, out of the way. Uh, yes, that's half of the airfix, 144th Lem says, oh yeah, 140. did I say 172nd? I meant 144th. Uh, right, so we want uh, lots of parts of the D sprue. Now I might be using my, again, before anybody panics, I might be using my god hand nippers to, uh, or my expensive nippers to get these parts off, but it's purely because they're so delicate and tiny. So, we need, uh, let's work our way around, D28. Oh, hang on, we've not got there yet. Oh, okay. We need to apply all these parts. There's an eyelash. Get off. We need to apply all these parts. So these are the steps. This, this kit's a little confusing. It shows like, here's the finished thing and here's all the steps. Now you need to do that. So yeah, don't get sidetracked. So D20, uh, 39, 40 and 35. That's what we want. 39, 40 and 35. Do I need big nippers for these or small? 39, 39. I can use my, I can use my little nippers for these. I think 39. Now I know some of you are screaming now because I'm using god hand nippers to get things off the sprue, but this is very soft plastic and they're very small uh, gates. 39, 35 and 40. 35 is there. If I try taking these off with them bigger nippers, it just destroy the... Actually that one's a bit big. It will just destroy the part, potentially. So I'm going in carefully. This one's a bit, the gates are a bit bigger, so I'm going to use my bigger nippers, but I'm going to go in slowly and carefully. I'll have to trim it back. That's 35. And 40. 40, which is... Yeah, it's got, it's a tiny part, but it's got big gates, which is a bit of a pain in the bum. Now, what I tend to do, if I'm cutting a piece off, and it's a tiny, delicate part, there are many of these, what I tend to do is, hold the part between finger and thumb and a little bit of the sprue and then cut it off down the sprue a little bit and the reason i'm holding the part between finger and thumb is i don't want to be cutting the sprue and for the sprue to bend and snap the part so always hold the part in place and let this side of the sprue bend not that side of the sprue it doesn't always work sometimes you fail miserably but there you go Casually wipe eyelash away, not realising it was agreeable. Yeah, possibly. Paul says it's what they've announced on their website. Uh, in that case, there obviously has been some confusion because we've had... I know what they said on the website, but then there's also some guy... I saw someone who had a contact from some employee saying, yes, we have closed. So they've obviously, they've obviously fudged and messed. Basically, they've made a mess of their communication of the close down. They've confused people. They could have probably communicated it a bit better because I was under the impression they had actually closed and gone out of business. Now we are going off like Reddit posts and things, but still. Mm -hmm. They need to clarify that, I think. My understanding was it was one of the owners of the CEOs had said, yes, we've gone out of business. We're closed. That's it. Bye. Sorry. Clearly that might not be the case. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Gently get these bits off. Now I am being super careful here. I'm being very slow and deliberate. And it's frustrating for you guys to watch, I know, for me to work so slowly. But it really is necessary on some of these tiny parts 
So these really tiny parts. You can't just whap a sanding sponge over some of these, sadly. And these aren't even the, wait till we get to some of the pipes and tubes, they're really tiny. Am I getting my head in shot, by the way, all the time? Do let me know. Okay, put that there. Remember folks, I'm, I'm doing my best to look at chat as often as I can. Uh, do I do count on you guys to give me stuff to talk about, so feel free to ask me anything in the chat. No religion, no politics, obviously. Uh, but ask me anything. Oof. I will do my best. If you want to ask me something, if you want to get my attention, please do put your comment in all in capital letters so I have a chance to see it standing out from the rest of the chat. Uh, or if you want to do a super chat, you can do. The little dollar sign at the bottom of the chat window. But, you know, just make sure it's... If it's in capitals, it's all in capitals. Just so your comment stands out in chat, because I've only got the option of quickly looking up at the chat. I'm not sitting there reading chat permanently, so... You need to catch my attentions. Mm -hmm. I can't remember where the nubs were on this now. There's one there. Is that a nub or is that part of the detail? That might be part of the detail. Uh, Fox, do you keep your sprue cutoffs for sprue glue or just throw it away? Uh, I will be at some point. At the moment, I throw away because I've got uh, I had a load of old plastic card that I didn't use to make sprue glue, so I don't need any to me make, make. I'll say that again. I don't need to make any more at the moment, but I don't want to waste plastic card. I had some old plastic card that I wasn't going to use for anything, so I sort of I was doing test sprue glue and use that, and it was fine. Uh, but yeah, I'll just. If I start getting low on sprue gear now, I'll just I'll keep some sprues for whatever I'm working on and uh, make it out of that. I don't keep them sat around because if you start to run low on sprue gear, you, you, generally you're going to be working on a kit at the time. Go for those nubs, nubs. Because uh, to me, the most satis one of the satisfying things about model making, or well, two of the satisfying things, aside from the actual build itself. This is my sanding pot, Fox. Remember, it's your sanding pot. Apart from that, I know what I'm not doing. Like a spoon. But it might make things hard for you to see, I don't know. If I use my little sanding mat that was very gifted, gifted to me very kindly by my friend Kenneth. Maybe it makes things easier to see, I don't know. I've been catching my sanding bits in that and I've got a whole mat here that I keep forgetting about. Oh uh, yeah, two of the most satisfying things when model making that isn't anything to do with the actual model itself uh, are, first of all, that moment when you can finally rip the box up and throw it in the recycling because you've finished the kit. Because I I always keep the box because I use the box to store things in while I'm on the build. So right now behind me, the box for this has all the sprues in alphabetical order stacked up so I can find them easily. Uh, there's nothing more satisfying than you feel you finish a build, especially one that's taken months like my Sazambi that took me a year. Get that finished up and the first thing you do is Rip that box to shreds. Oh, it's very cathartic. Very cathartic. Uh, a little mould line down the middle of this tube. Oh, there's a nub there. Where's my knife? There it is. Uh, but the other thing that you can do as you go along, before you get to the box ripping stage, is when you take the last part off a sprue in the middle of a build, I like to then just chop the sprue up into little tiny bits with me with me heavy duty nippers and stick it in the bag stick it in the trash bag <gasps> that's like it's the middle of the build equivalent of tearing the box up it's very satisfying uh how's the new knife much interested in getting one as the brats came up to the bench and generally interfere don't want them getting spiked yes i was very kindly gifted that uh, by phil who gave gifted me this uh, it says swan morton if you remember, I've always used a Swan Morton surgical scalpel. This is a, a different variant. It's a Swan Morton. It's metal, so it's, it's rock hard. It's nice and weighty, but it's got the slidey, slidey bit. There you go. How lovely is that? I was very kind of gifted that. And uh, 
it's very nice it's very weighty and, it's, and you can obviously dispose the blade you can take the blade off and replace it if you need to so i'm loving that that is my new knife and i love it it's it's nice and weighty and it's comfortable on my hands so yes i do recommend it it's one morton I, I don't know if the e-models guys will have one but if they haven't they can get one in because this stocks one morton stuff does it say what it is it is i didn't keep the thing for it did i i don't think i did hang on i may have it here somewhere uh, or i may not do, 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 do. there we go it is it is uh if you want to ask the guys at e models if they haven't got it in stock if they can get one it's the retract away oh no it may just be called the retract away blade doesn't actually say what it is but yes yeah, e models do stock swan morton so if they haven't got this specific one in stock i'm sure you can you know what let's just cut that i'm sure they can uh, they can get it for you Yes, if you've got little kiddles around, that is a godsend. I mean, I'm an idiot, so it's a godsend for me as well. And there's nothing on that. Okay. It might just be called the retract away uh, disposable blade thing. But yeah, I love it. It is fantastic. Uh... Speedy Q8 says, so an overtly religious politician walks into a hospital. Oh, wait, what's the taboo subjects again? Speed. Why, yeah, you order. Swan Morton Premium Retractable Handle. There you go. That's the one you're looking for. So they may have it in stock, but like I say, if they haven't, don't worry. Just drop them an email. They'll be able to get them. They're fairly, fairly commonplace type uh, things to get. That's that piece cleaned up. Now you may notice I'm going I'm going the whole hog here and doing lots of little tiny fiddly bits of cleanup on little tiny greebles. But you know what? That's how I do what I do. That's just that's the way fox do. Put that to there to one side. Get the get the bits off. That is just how a fox do. Excellent. Thank you. Sold on the new knife, says Donald. Yes. A, it's not going to roll off your desk because it's square. B, like me, as soon as you've finished it, if you get in the habit of just sheathing the blade, as soon as you cut, 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 and sheath the blade, plus you can also do it a little bit. If you got, if you don't want the blade to be wiggling around and you want a little bit of blade, there you go. Jamie Shiner says, uh, Hi, when you come to do the two central guns in the middle of the model, you can light them up, all the work, see nothing. Take an MSD and put it between the two, then cover the two inside holes. Uh, this does come with a lighting kit. This is the limited edition now at Falcon, which was unfortunately a limited run, so they don't make it anymore. Um, but e-models do stock the regular kit of this, but the limited edition one does come with a lighting kit. It's only a basic lighting kit. I hate doing any kind of electric and wiring and stuff, so I don't mind doing pre-made lighting kits. However, because this is uh, an e-models build, I don't get to keep this. It goes back to them. So I don't spend any money on this. I'm not going to invest in a lighting kit uh, or my own scratch built lighting to do extra lighting. I'm just literally building it out of the box. Uh, but yes, if you are making one of these yourself, it would benefit from some extra lighting in the in the gun walls because they're, they're kind of dark. Um, but yeah, with, with e-models builds, uh, me, uh, all of us, basically, we, we don't tend to... Uh, <clears throat> we don't tend to do any extras that aren't in the box or available when i did the eagle transporter uh there was there is for the eagle transporter uh, an aftermarket metal engine bell kit uh but it wasn't something that e-models had in stock at the time and i wasn't going to spend 150 pound on that to uh, to add it to the kit because say so we don't get to keep these we have to give these back so we're not going to spend our own money on these And it's it's also a bit because these are this is this is a premium kit. So if there were lots of extras and things like that, and even if e-models had them in the stock, it's a bit much to for them to give all that stuff to me to make. I know they get it back, but you know they do want to sell them. So but yes, we don't we don't spend our own money on these. And D thirty nine is that one. D thirty nine, which looks suspiciously like. Uh, the rear mudguard off a tank of some sort or an armoured personnel carrier. 
even with the little uh, indicator light stalk sticking out the side. I suspect that's probably what it is. Uh, this needs to go that way. This needs to go on here like there, Trussy. And it just sits in. Let me get my tweezers later. Yeah. That sits in there like that. Lava. Excellent. That is a really tight fit, but I'm still going to glue it anyway. It's a really tight fit. I like that. But ultimately, the thing with me is I am I am rubbish at any kind of electronics. I hate doing that kind of stuff. I'm no use at it. It confuses me. I get confused wiring a plug. So I will never do complicated lighting in a model uh, unless it comes with the lighting itself or unless somebody, you know, sends me a light. When I did the Eagle Transporter, uh, I was actually sent that lighting kit. One of the viewers actually sent the kit and it was dead simple. So I thought, okay, there you go. But I would never have done it myself. Uh, D40, D40, which goes here, which is that way around. Now this is going to be the majority of the of the of this. There's the eyebrow again. I lash not eyebrow. It's <laughs> an entire eyebrow on the desk. Yeah, no, not quite fox. A lot of this build is going to be these little tiny fiddly parts. Uh, and this was like I said, this was going to be. I did start filming it as a time lapse. Oh, uh, I did start filming it as a time lapse. But like I say, I suddenly realised that like half an hour of me just doing this, but at super speed. Would not be interesting at all for you guys to watch. I thought you, it's much more interesting for you guys if I actually do it as a live, do it as a series of live streams, and that way we can hang out, we can have a laugh. Yeah, it'll take probably weeks, about like thirty live streams of me just gluing little tiny greebles on the hole, but it'll be fun. Uh, let's have a look. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think your model search engine might be broken. It goes to a blank screen. Ooh, that's a bit weird. Let them know. Uh, uh, Scott Sutherland uh, from Orkney is in chat and he, he was telling me that his ouch mouse, he's got a hedgehog that lives in his garden, his ouch mouse was strutting around the garden like he owns a place last night, Fox. You know why? Because he does. It's his garden now. It's not your garden, it's his garden. I like ouch mouses. Ouch mouse! Uh, right, quick look at chat. Apart from Ted, who gave one of his U-boat crewmen an iPhone, well, that was a little square of plastic card. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna not do little customizing bits sometimes because that's just silly fun. But I'm not gonna spend money on a kit that I can't keep. Uh, Jamie Shiner says, then why are the MS SMDs to the main box and resistor the lighting down to give ambience? I know what those words mean individually. I have no, I don't even I can't even wire a plug. Trust me on that. Trust me. I can't I wouldn't even be able to wire a plug without looking it up on the internet. So when you say just you may as well be talking I don't know, Greek or something. I've no idea. Uh Pete May needs to get them in stock, not there at the moment. What are not in stock? Uh, if there's something, if something is not in stock, drop them a note, guys. Fill out the form, let them know, because they won't know that people. If something's out of stock, but nobody's asking them for it, they're not going to be in a rush to get it stopped. Everybody's saying, "Can you get this thing?" Let them know, and we'll get it in. If keep in mind, of course, though, guys and girls, uh, getting stuff in stock's a challenge right now because it may well be they taunt at the distributors, "Hey, we need these things," and they'll be like, "Yeah, well, so do we, but we ain't getting no deliveries from X country or Y country." because the entire world's on fire so yeah getting stuff in stock is not a just situation right now it's not a just get it in stock it's more a case of they might not be able to but let them know that you need something that they haven't got because uh, they won't know otherwise uh... also glue down the bit sticking up by the engines uh, as the tape provided is not enough to hold them and they'll be keep coming off. Uh, I'll be gluing the crap out of hold this whole build. This will be glued within an inch of its life. I'm treating this effectively like the fine molds kit. I'm just gluing everything on. Like I said at the start, purely because I've got to get I've got to hand it off to e models and it's gonna sit in their cabin. It's got to survive the journey to them 
and they've got to handle it. And yeah. If I didn't glue any of this on, they'd move it to a different cabinet and all the bits would fall off and they'd be like, well, what do we do now? So it's got to survive E-models handling it. Uh, D28 and 8 and 7 and 5. 5, 7, 8 and 28. Let's not put that on top of the tools that I need. 5, 7, 8 and 28. Right, what have we got? 5, 7, 28 8. Let's put that there. 5, where's 5? I can use my little nippers for those. Five. Seven. It is fun to look at some of these bits and, and recognize components from vehicles that you've made in the past. Like this bit here, part seven, is blatantly obvious. I don't know what it's called on a tank, but it's, you know, on a tank you have like the, you have the main gun and then you have that rounded bit that the gun goes into. And obviously there you've got like, you've got the hole for the main gun and you've got the little hole here where you glue on the, the, um, the machine gun that's alongside it. I guess it's off a Panzer IV, maybe, I think. And they've stuck some other bits on top. But yeah, that's the, 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 the the curved bit that I don't know what they're called on tank. I don't know tanks that well, so but you know what I mean. The mantlet says Scott. Yes, Scott knows about tanks. The mantlet. So it's clearly the mantlet. I would suspect off a Panzer. Mm, it could be a Sherman, I suppose. But yeah, you've got the you've got the the main gun there, and then the and then the uh, the hole for the coaxial machine gun, and it's even got the little bit in the middle to position it. Yeah, mantlet says Spid. It's called the mantlet. Uh, Donald McKenzie says started to notice the hedgehogs more and more again around the Helensburg area. Cool. Hedgehogs are cool. Hedgehogs are awesome. You can't go wrong with hedgehogs. Uh, five, seven, eight, which I know what that part looks like. This is a delicate, delicate part. Now I'm going to be very careful here. This is where my, this is where my God hands come in. Eh, very delicate that was. Now with the other piece, I can go in with the big nippers because that's a big stonky bit there. There we go. Stonky donkey. Going slowly. I do recommend you. Hello, I'm being Skyped. What's that? Who's Skyping me? Uh, now, it might be rude that I'm doing this, but I've got Skype open in case, like, you know, Pete, mate, or James, mate from eModels need to contact me. Uh... Oh, no, no, that wasn't for me. Cool. Yes, I do recommend if you're building. Either you've got this kit, the one with the lighting stuff, or just the regular um, perfect grade Falcon. I do recommend, especially with so many little tiny fiddly tubes and pipes, which we'll get to eventually. I do recommend, if you're the kind of modeler that tends to use a craft knife or a modeling knife to get parts off the sprue, you really don't want to do that. You really do not want to do that. Not with some of the parts on this. I do recommend you invest in a, <clears throat> a good set of nippers. Have a general purpose big clunky set like these. And then have a set. You can't get these are God hands. You won't get these anywhere in the UK without penning for you. You can't get these. But e models do have lots of Zuron nippers and some other brands of very fine detail cutting nippers. Um, in the rough and ready category, I would include the uh, Tamiya side cutters because they're quite heavy duty. So like these or these are your kind of nippers these are your heavy for big thick parts where there's big thick tree connection points but for some of your finer bits you want to have a look and get yourself some real fine delicate cutters i say i've got these god hands you can't get these don't even try and get these unless you live in not like, japan or the asian territories don't even bother or the us um but yeah they've got lots of zurons which are just as good so try and get some of those but try and have more than one pack a heavy pair uh, and a fine delicate pair because we're going to have some really tiny parts ted's in skipper scale models yeah hi ted motion blur hi ted how you doing buddy sorry i couldn't uh, meet uh, join your stream earlier on i was getting everything sorted out and was tied up doing other things but thank you for coming in sorry i missed you earlier do not dry fit the major parts as they will not come apart uh yeah i know i'm going very slowly i've uh, I've, I've built my fair share of bandai so I know they're kind of how they work. I'm going to take these pieces off now. Uh, 
I know with the mandibles, for example, I'm perfectly fine to glue these together because I don't need to take these apart again. So I will be absolutely fine. But thank you for the advice. Get these back over there. I'm going to get have to get these all off again in a minute. So I'm going to put them all over there for peg. Uh, right, so I've got these parts. Need to, what did I get all of them? I've got one, two, three. I need D28. D28 is what I need. Philip books in. Afternoon ladles and jelly spoons. Welcome, Phil. Oh, it's 9pm. Who did I miss this morning then? Oh, I've goofed, haven't I? Is it me? Oh, it was Chris. Oh, sorry, it was Chris I missed, wasn't it? Not you. Sorry, Chris. It was Chris I missed earlier on. Apologies that I couldn't watch your thing, Chris. Now, here's an interesting one. Oh, well, do we need... Uh, oh, no, we don't need it yet. There's a piece on the sprue here, which you probably can't see. But to my eye, that's a 50 cal. Uh, a 50 cal browning with some other stuff stuck on the end of it. And it literally is a 50 cal browning. With a bit of, In the studio model, I'll have got a 50 cal browning from, say, a Sherman kit. And they'll have stuck that on the end of it. And that'll be the component. <laughs> it's even got this. It, well, it, might be not, oh, it might be a browning. I don't know. It's got this little widget on the side there. But that could be just for attachment. I don't know if it's the actual magazine. I love identifying bits. It's great. Right, D28. That's not me getting stuff done. Uh, where's 28? 28. You can go on a real greeble hunt. You really can on this. They've done such a fantastic job. I mean, if you've built the fine moulds Millennium Falcon, that was a beautiful kit. But that was of its time. See, here, here's the... Look at that. How's that for a shot? <gasps> that was a shot, that was. Here's the chronology of Millennium Falcon kits. Uh, when Star Wars first came out, all the kits were rubbish. And then in, I think, 2003, Fine Moulds made their Millennium Falcon. And that was the first decent Millennium Falcon kit. But all the other Falcons were still rubbish. And then they stopped making it when Ravel got the license to do Star Wars. So Ravel now sell the Fine Moulds Millennium Falcon as their Master Series Falcon. So that is the same kit. It's a beautiful kit. It's a proper glue together kit. Uh, and it's only beaten by this, which is a bit more detailed and a bit more accurate. And it's push fit. So this is the best Falcon you're going to get. Close second to this will be the Fine Moulds Falcon. Yeah, there's a Diagostini one in there again, but that's a big massive part work, so it's not quite the same. Everything else is just, yeah, don't even bother. It's not going to come close to this. Right, so we've got those parts. Need to clean those up. Looks like a 50 cal to me, says Philip Book. Yep, and to me, dude. Uh, when finished painting, ghost over with Tamiya Insignia White. This helps the whole look. Don't you worry, Jamie. I've got a whole colour scheme worked out. Because I, I did some... I built a few with Falcons. And I did a lot of testing to try and get the closest match to the paints that ILM would have used. Because the original Falcon was painted with some um, test, uh, testers, I think it was. Paints. Which you can't get in the UK very easily. Uh, they were painted with a mixture of uh, reefer white and grime. I think it was testers. Reefer white. No, Floquil. Sorry, talking rubbish. Floquil paints, which you absolutely can't get in the UK. Uh, Floquil reefer white and a paint called grime. It was a mix of those. Now, there's no hard and fast information as to what the exact mix was because the guys at ILM never kept any records. So they, even they've said we... I can't remember, you know, I read an interview where the guy was like, I know what colours were used. I can't tell you the mix because it's 40 years ago and I don't know what I did last week. But it was reefer white and grime. I think it might have been called something grime. But it was definitely grime and reefer white. They were railway colours. They were designed for like rail stock, painting rail stock, miniature railways. Now those paints don't exist anymore. You can't get them. Uh, so I do have, I did figure out a nice similar colour, a sort of similar colour that's close enough with readily available paints. I'll be using Tamiya paints and I will show us, a little, I'll show my special source, my special secret mix that I'll let you into that, that does a reasonable, reasonable colour. But there'll be no rattle cans. Uh, I did... I have painted one Falcon that was primed in black and then I used uh, Tamiya's Insignia White. Uh, one of the other whites, which I can't remember. Uh, and that came out a bit too shifted to the blue. It wasn't warm enough. 
that was using the rattle cans, the TS sprays. It wasn't warm enough. Uh, a, a sort of white, grey, white colour. It was a bit too blue. So the next one I did, I came up with my little magical concoction of colours. Which is rough and ready, but it, it kind of works. You'll see. You'll see. It'll be a long time before I get to the paint in there. Oh, yeah. But it's going to be a full airbrush job, this. No rattle cans. Unless, I, well, I don't know. I might rattle can the primer, but I don't know. I'd rather not, but we shall see. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, model making truckers in. How do you guys and gals? I thought you were in earlier. Did you go away and come back again? Uh, Speedy QA. I wonder if an alternative space universe, if someone is building a movie tank model and saying, if you look carefully, you can see this bit is the quantum fluctuator from the rocket booster of a hover car. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what else we've got going on? Uh, there's a guy that's researched the original colours and has some great enamel paints, but it's not in models. Yeah, I don't know why anybody would want to paint anything in enamels. I, I have no understanding of this. I want the, the, I, I, I saw that a few days ago and I'm like, why would somebody make enamel paint? I don't get it. Why would you not paint with acrylics or at the very worst lacquers? You don't, nobody should be spraying enamel paints. Enamel paints are good for weathering. And model railroading. They do have the use of model railroading because that it does demand a tougher paint than acrylic, obviously. So a lot of people that do model railroading and model railways, they use enamel paints. Which makes sense. Because they're a lot more durable than acrylics. But for model making like we do, use acrylics. They don't stink. You don't need white spirits. Uh, there's a few there's a few companies that have done colours for the Millennium Falcon. I got sent some test paints, and I can't remember the name of the company. And I never got around to use them, unfortunately. Uh, but there's a few companies that have like formulated a colour that is like Millennium Falcon grey. Um, but I'll just be showing how to how I mix it with just regular Tamiya paint. I use two colours. All will be revealed. No funky, there's no funky complicated mixing, no special mixing rate. Well, there is a ratio, but it's not, you don't have to do any maths. It's nice and simple. I'll show it, and anybody can do it. And it might not be the most, it might not be 100% accurate. Jamie Shannon says, Look back at my comments, it'll help with the Falcon build. I have been noticing, dude, don't worry. I'll lose a bit of skin on my thumb there, on my finger. I have been taking note, dude, thank you very much. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm going to clear my throat for a second, hang on. Little frog in my throat there, I do apologise. Yes, I've been seeing your comments, Jamie, thank you very much for those. All has been noted. Uh, food nothing yet, working on the Titanic lighted model. Uh, Philip Books says, how's the new knife? I'm loving it. I'm loving it. It's like McDonald's. Don't mention McDonald's. I can't get McDonald's right now and it's making me really sad. But I can get KFC and I'm liking that. <laughs> yeah. Right, so this needs to go here. Put that over there. Uh, so we have D28 needs to go. Is that one? It needs to go... to go there I think yes this needs to go here is it or does it hang on hang on hang on no nope, that needs to go there get on oh I don't want to use tweezers because it's not small enough piece to warrant tweezers there we go that sits on there like that lovely doubly Little touch of the old glues Again, it's just agreeable. It never needs to come off ever again. And there we go. Do, 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 do. I would guess, I don't know, but I would guess just from the look of that piece, it's probably, it looks like the kind of, if you've ever made like a, a model of a Flak 88 or a deck gun from a U-boat and it's got that kind of central core piece that you put together in two halves and then the rest of it goes around it, it looks like that really. It's got a little thing there to sit down onto the base and then, the centre bit here, which will be the axle for the... I, I'm, it could be that. It might not be. Uh, D8. It needs to be there. And that needs to go... Big tab, little tab, cardboard box. 
a big tub little tub this is a part that I kept I always used to break on the fine molds kit because I made a few more fine molds falcons I used to break this part somehow it never used to survive Timmy Nip says you can get Mac McDonald's delivered now not around here you can't it's maximum sadness I can get Kentucky Fried Chicken delivered yay but our local Mackey's doesn't have it yet And I, I'm not saying that McDonald's is the best food in the world, of course. It's, it's just it's just junk food. But when it's been 12 weeks and you just get that, you know what I mean? It's something we have occasionally. If we're having a lazy day, and like if I really can't be bothered making any food and I'm, I'm happy to just pop out to McDonald's and get scran, like me and Mama Fox, it's fine. But it's just them times when you're like, you know, oh. But because it's been like 10 weeks or 12 weeks or whatever. Torture. I've been living off Morrison's food boxes. We've been living off potatoes and onions and carrots for the last 10 weeks. Don't get me wrong, I've been enjoying them. But I've eaten more onions and carrots and potatoes in the last 10 weeks than a, a normal man should ever have to endure. Do, 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 do. Uh, does anyone know why there isn't a consistent colour code between paint manufacturers having a fine time trying to match Tamiya paints to my Bandai model? Um, there's no reason for them to do that. If it's made up colours that aren't, you know, specific to a real world thing. Like if somebody wants to make World War II Luftwaffe colours, they're obviously trying to make them as close to the real thing as possible. Uh, if they're just making up, you know, sky blue or something. They'll just go off whatever pigments and formulations they want. They won't pay attention to any other paint manufacturer. Because they won't care. Because if everybody made the same colour of sky blue, why would you buy one brand over the other? Yeah, no, no, no. Uh, the, 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 sometimes you do get some similar colours and that's often where there's a manufacturer that makes paints for more than one company like the company uh, if you look at some of the coat d'arms paints uh, they look very very similar in fact are exactly the same as some of the old Games Workshop Citadel paints because coat d'arms is the company that used to make the Citadel paints before it went to somewhere else uh, and if you look at the Vallejo game colour paints uh, they are very very similar uh, to some of the old Citadel paints because when Citadel, the Games Workshop, was going to move away from the guys that have coat d'arms and they were looking to get a new manufacturer, one of the companies they looked at was Vallejo and they formulated their game range as a thing to Games Workshop to say, here's the paints we can come up with. And then they went with somebody else anyway. So that's where the game colour came from. Uh, that makes my fine... Uh, let's have a look. Marky B says, I've got Falcon Envy. That makes my fine molds kit look like the old Kenner toy. Trust me, aside from there, aside from this, the, the fine molds kit is the most accurate kit you're going to get. This is more accurate, but it's still, I've made it. I've made a handful of those fine molds kits and they are lovely. Uh, if you can't get this kit, then your next stop is the fine molds. And if, if anybody's wondering about the fine molds kit, of course, that stopped being produced in 2000 and... 11 i'm wanting to say but i could be wrong it stopped production a while ago but basically that was when revel got the license to sell star wars kits in europe and uh, up until that point they got the exclusive license which meant fine molds could no longer and in the us as well so at that point no one else could manufacture star wars kits under license because fine molds were licensed to make theirs in the in the asian territory so in japan and uh, korea and countries like that uh, however revel just simply paid fine molds and said right <clears throat> stick our logo on your box and keep making it so if, <clears throat> excuse me if you go on ebay now you'll see that fine molds millennium falcon kits for like six seven hundred quid because they're out of print however it's just if you get the the uh, revel master series falcon that's the old fine molds kit. Just re rebadged. I think they've changed the plastic a bit as well, but yeah. But it's basically the fine mold. I think that it's made under license. I think fine molds still make it. 
and then it's rebadged as Ravel. There we go, a little tiny bit of greeble there. It is the tiniest greeble in the land. Whoa, Hogan35 is in. Tony's in. Hey, Tony. Tony's the other remodels builder that you never hear from on the live streams because he's rubbish and we never get old. We he can never join in because he's rubbish. And you never see him on live stream chats again because hey, Tony. How you doing, buddy? Nice to have you around. Uh, but he's skiving, he's at work. So, shh, don't say anything. I have the old NPC Falcon Return of the Jedi version, says I. It's EC Idaho. Yeah, God, that kit is so inaccurate. It's a great little kit. It's not, it's not. I started making them on many, many years ago. And I took the dashboard from a, a Tamiya Toyota Corolla, I think it was, and hacked it around to make it into a consent console for the cockpit. I was only like 15 or 16. Yeah. Apparently, the reason all those old uh, Falcon kits were so inaccurate was that when the uh, MPC and Ertl and all that lot were given access to the Falcon to make their models, they were only given access to concept drawings and, and set. They weren't given access to the actual filming models. So that's why they're all so horribly inaccurate. And they never bothered updating them. Uh, if I remember right, the Fine Molds kit was the first one where they actually got access to the studio models to actually take reference images. Uh, Marky B says the fine molds kit is too flat. Bandai are the first to get the curve of the hull anywhere near, right? Yeah, it's kind of a mixture of the fine molds one is a mixture of the Empire Strikes Back and a New Hope. It's kind of a weird hodgepodge. So is this one a little bit, but this one's a bit more accurate. Right, now we're getting to serious business now. Serious business. This goes over there. I'll put that there for the moment. Right. We need part W17. Uh, how you doing, Tony? It's nice to see you, mate. Not been around for a while. <clears throat> Gotta run, guys. The doctor's here to look at stuff again. Be safe, everyone. Thanks for coming in there, buddy. No, you couldn't stay long. But don't worry. He says, now then, Fox lad. Fox, why are you gluing? There's no need. This kit fits like a dream. Um, I have said a few times, but maybe you missed it, that this kit does fit like a dream. But I don't get to keep this. When I finish this build, it has to go back to e-models. Uh, and given the fact that the entire world is on fire, it's going to go back to e-models in a, in a shipping crate. And once it gets to e-models, <coughs> excuse me, once it gets to e-models, uh, they'll be putting it in their display cabinet, and then occasionally they might move it round. Uh, and if you've ever had one of your models handled by somebody else, you'll know how nightmare that is. And the last thing I want to happen is for the guys at e-models to have to move the falcon oops need to keep that nearly cut that nub off then that tab off then uh, to move the falcon to make some space in the cabinet and all the greebles fall off because it will happen because they won't know what to do they won't know how to put it back together again and i can't just i can't drive you know an hour and a half to e-models just to stick a greeble back on so uh, I'm making sure it's all glued in place because once it goes to them, it has to stay together and never fall apart. So, yeah, that's it, basically. I wouldn't normally glue it, but because it needs to travel and because it needs to live in their store forever, I need to make sure it doesn't fall apart. Now, they did have some idea. James, mate, the manager, did have this idea. I might have been Pete, mate, the owner. Might have had this idea of maybe stringing it up on some threads and hanging it from the ceiling. No. That's not going to happen. <laughs> you don't hang hundreds of pounds worth of model up from the ceiling, guys. It's not, it's not how it works. Because all that happens is something snaps, it falls to the floor, it breaks, or it just gets covered in dust forever and never seen again. No, 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 no. This will go in the cabinet. I'm building, just so you know, I am building this in flight mode, so I'm not going to be worried about the interior. It'll be built with the landing gear up, uh, and it'll be built as if flying to sit on the display base. I'm not building it landed with the gear down and the ramp down and stuff like that. So I'm not going to bother with the interior parts. It's being built in flight. I mean, if they want to string it up from the ceiling, they can do, but it'll look rubbish because it's, you'll walk in and you'll, all you'll ever, people ever see is the underside from like seven feet, eight feet away. It won't be that interesting. Have it in the cabinet where people can oogle. Right. Uh, do, 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 do. My NPC kit uh, is unbuilt, still in the box. Uh, there are actually third party or aftermarket things you can buy to accurize it, bizarrely, you believe it or not. Like resin stuff that you can get to, uh, to massively update it. 
but it's a heck of a lot of work <laughs> i wouldn't recommend it to be perfectly honest just go with i would just not worry about it too much it's a horribly inaccurate kit but you know what it's still fun to build it's still a fun little falcon to build and that's the thing if you just want a quick simple falcon this i mean i know i, ra I rag on the revel kits but they're not accurate in any way shape or form but they are good fun to build the bigger ones not not the master series one but the, the non-master you know the revel one that's like 30 quid or something and not the easy snap together ones but they're not accurate they're not even they begin to compare to this but they're still fun to build and if you haven't got hundreds of pounds lying around for one of these but you want to get some falcon goodness going on get one of them they're good fun they're good silly fun you, it's more about having fun painting and weathering and not losing too much sleep about the accuracy when it comes to the falcon because when it comes to the other star wars vehicles and this is the big thing x-wings and snow speeders and stuff bandai is always going to win hand down hands down because the build quality and because the detail and accuracy and they're about the same price but when it comes to a falcon you either spend a lot of money or you just have fun well you spend a lot of money and have fun or you just have fun so i'm not going to knock the revel offerings the big revel offerings for being because some of the old some of the revel kits are actually the mpc ones from like 30 40 years ago and all the inaccuracies there but they're still fun they're still fun no right now we need to get a really fiddly part this is where we get sweaty uh, squeaky bum time now because I've got to go in the ice brew. Oh, look at that. Oh, I need I-31. I can guarantee you, at some point throughout this process, I will snap at least one of these. Even more annoying is if I do it while I'm handling the sprue and not actually cutting part off. But so I-31 is, is uh, this. This little device here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my delicate nippers. I'm going to cut this bit off first. If I try and cut one of these off, the risk is one of the end pieces, it puts that middle bit under tension and that causes snappage. So I'm going to try and take the middle piece first, gently as I can. There. I'm not trying to push the, the nippers. I didn't want to go like that with it and then push it, bend it that way. So now I've not got the bit in the middle. So if I try and snip this end off now, it should release the energy. So I'm knocking the camera door pause. I'll take this end first. I'm going to go in very, very gently, carefully as I can, because I also don't want to damage my nippers. Carefully as I can. Nip. There we go. And now this end is free to be snapped off. No problems. There we go. Oops. Tink. There we go. Perfect. So when you're doing when you're doing things like rods and tubes. If you've got like that where it's got a center piece in the middle don't do the end first because if you do that and that bit bends it's stuck there you're forcing it to bend see i'm trying to snip this off if i try and cut this end off first pretend that bit's not going to talk forget that one let's do this one if i'm trying to cut this piece off here if i cut here first or there that bit's going to bend but it's anchored there and it's going to snap if i cut this bit off first there's still a risk it'll snap but it can flex between these two much easier than it can between a center point. And once that's done, it's, it's a lot less dangerous. I, I will end up snapping something. I can guarantee you that. And there's not just one of these, there's about four of the sprues like this. This is why it won't be a quick build. Whoa. Uh, where are we? Uh, I had the original Star Wars 4 release with lights too, but built that one. Uh, Philip Booker, Dale from work, that's why I'm sat here trying to convince the wife that Millennium Falcon is an essential purchase. I think I'm losing. Mrs. Philip Book, it is an essential purchase. And it will make Mr. Philip Book an awesome human being if he has one to build. Trust me. You will benefit from his happiness in many ways that we can't discuss on the Family Friendly Show, but in other ways as well. It will bring him nothing but happiness. Now, here's the thing. How do you sound nubs off a delicate little tube like that that wants to snap? With all its might, it wants to snap. Well, first of all, you have to consider where the nubs are. Uh, this nub here is actually on the bit that goes in. It's the little tab, so I can 
I can very quickly, I don't need to worry about this one too much because this is the bit that goes into the slot. But also it's a nice flat section so I can hold it. But sometimes you'll get nubs on the actual tube. What I would recommend if you're trying to sand nubs off these, don't use a sanding stick. Don't use sandpaper, don't use a sanding sponge, and try not to use a knife. I would get yourself some, some metal files. Purely because they can sand it away, they can they can file away any nubs without with minimum damage to this and without minimum wiggling. If you use a sanding sponge, it's gonna it can take a lot more work to file that nub away, and every time you sand it, it's bending back and forth, it's gonna snap. So if you get yourself a metal file, find your nub. Now the nubs on here are actually on the flat parts, I think. I think. Yeah, that one there. I'm not going to hold it by the tube. I'm going to hold it by the flat part because I don't want the tube to bend. And I'm very gently going to sand it. But the trick is use a metal file, almost no pressure. Use the weight of the file and only go in one direction. Don't go backwards and forwards because you're bending things. If you go one direction, it's a lot less stress on the plastic part. And go very gently. Don't put any excess pressure on at all. That's it. Now, if I'd held it here and done that, this would have bent. Basically, the flexion is where my finger and thumb are. If I'd held it halfway down that tube and sanded it, that whole tube would have bent like that and it would have snapped. If I hold it by the flat bit, it's not going to bend. Now, if you've got, a, if you've got say, a, a nub on the actual tube itself, the trick then is to anchor it in your finger so it can't move very easily and just go in one direction very lightly. And if you were, say, sanding on this tube, no weight just rest it on there and that's all the weight you want don't push down just i mean if i held it like that that would be the kind of weight i would use i'm not even pushing it down but see how i anchor this bit here with my finger so it can't flex back and forth it's all about making sure it can't wiggle and flex that's the risky bit that's the bit where this always falls over now where's the other nub is at this end on here the nub is right on the end of the tube so I have to sand it. So I'm going to get my thumb and finger as close to that end as I can. Again, the, fle the, the flex happens where the thumb and finger meet. And I'm just going to very gently, no weight, just run that over like that. And there you go. I'm not even going to touch it with a sanding sponge. And in fact, we do actually have a nub on the tube there. So let's put my words into practice. There is a slight nub on the outside of the tube. That's the best way to hold this now. I mean, it's going to be like that. It's just, you won't see it, but it's just there. So I want to sand that down, but I don't want to flex and bend it. So I'm going to, no pressure. I'm curving the, the file so it can follow the curve of the, I don't want to get a flat spot. So I'm curving the file. It is quite tricky to hold this in a way that's not going to bend. So... You, you, you get a feel for it. I'm just going to very gently run it over. If I did this with a sanding sponge, it would take twice as much work and it's twice as much risk of anything bending and snapping. So it's slow work, this. It's really slow work. Try it this way around. So that's bending now because of my thumb there. So what I might do is hold it like that, holding on the flat bit. Take a risk, risk it for a biscuit. Hold it on the flat bit. I hope you can see all this, you probably can't. And I'll try it there. I'm not putting any pressure on, I'm barely using the weight of the file. But this is not something you want to do with a sandpaper file or a sanding sponge. There, that nub's now gone. And we have a sanded tube. Now it may be that you have a seam line or a mould line down the middle of that tube. <clears throat> yeah, that's where it gets challenging. You could use your knife blade to go down the... If you've got a mould line down the middle, you could use a knife blade, but a knife blade will jump and skitter, and it could risk bending it. If you've got yourself uh, a, 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 a mould removal tool, this is the Citadel one, but other brands are available. It's a, it's a non-flexible steel blade, and that is a slightly gentler way to remove it. But to be all, in all honesty... If there was a mould line down the middle of that, I would be tempted not to try and get rid of it. If I couldn't get rid of it with a very gentle bit of filing, like that, all the way down, 
I could tr you could try that and that might work but if that wasn't removing it the it, the risk would be such that I'd probably tend to leave it luckily <coughs> there isn't I'm waiting for when you take off part 24 it drove me mental part 24 which is what I 24 which is oh that one this little puppy here oh yeah I'm yeah, I'm not making this kit. I'm going to put this kit back in the box now. <laughs> that might be a bit that I do off camera. <laughs> you watch it be on the next bit and I'll be like, oh, no. Oh. Right, let's make a coffee. I like, uh, no, like car frame. Uh, where are we? Just finished the Revell cheap kit. Weathering was excellent fun and always learned something new with every kit. And now it's stuck to the lad's bedroom wall. That's the thing. I mean, I know I, I do rip on Revell. And I know, I'm happy to admit that I do, because they churn stuff out of low quality and and taint the market with low quality nonsense. Pilot High sell it cheap. But that doesn't mean they don't do some good stuff. They do do some good stuff. Of course they do. They, you know, they make excellent car kits. I'm not into car kits, but some of their car kits are excellent. One other handy tip as well, if you had a nub on this, on this uh, tube, and it was on the top side here, you could actually attach this first and then fix it. Because once it's in place on here, of course, it's locked in place. Now I'm loath to push this in, but I have to. Oh, that was stressful. There we go. The one frustrating thing about the fine molds kit is that for a lot of these tubes, they're equally as thin and fiddly, but they have them split so that the, the tube might be molded from the center part and then comes out along the hole but it's two pieces of tube with a, but they have rounded ends so you have two pieces of tube like that with a gap it's not like two it's not like a straight end where they can just go together and make it it's you get them and it's oh it's so frustrating when they do that i don't know why they made that choice but there you go i shall glue that down where it is in there because that needs to go into that little hole there's a little recess in there for the tube i'll get my little where's me spudger where's me spudger spudger little spudging stick i can spudge that down into that spudge there you go that can sit down there again i don't need to glue that in but if now i've glued it in it's never going to come off and there's no chance of it getting knackered while it's being moved around uh, right, quick look at the chat. Mm, mm, mm. It's mainly because Bandai could 3D scan the filming models. The tech just wasn't about when Fine Molds made their kit. This is true. They did laser scan it to get as much accurate as possible. Uh, use a knife with the pipes as they will break if you don't, says Jamie. Well, yeah, I've, I, I've no, I've never cut things off a sprue with a knife because it's just a really bad idea. I always break stuff when I do that. <coughs> Do apologize for my tickly throat uh, but yeah i know i know i riff on the uh, the, the revel stuff but it can be fun if you if you just focus on the painting it can be good fun right what's next uh i20 and d38 well let's take the coward's way and do d38 first d38 d38 is that's w for a start not d you spoon folks you spoon was it D38? D38. Uh, it is... D38 is there. Do I recognise it? No. Some piece of mechanical stuff from an engine block of some sort, I think. Uh, where's me? Big boy nippers. There we go. Do, 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 do. When it comes to cleaning nubs off, Bandai's white plastic is just the nicest thing to clean nubs off i don't know why it just is it's the most forgiving because you don't get any stress marks because it's white plastic and if you stress it it just stays white so like if it was say green or blue or something with a dark color uh, if you when you trim it and cut it you just get all the white stress marks it's a nightmare but when it's you know, trying to get it all nice and clean but when it's white plastic the stress marks are the same color yes okay so there we go Nicely tidied up, laid away. Uh, 
and I actually find with their white plastic it's actually much easier and nicer to file than hardly ever sand at all because it's just with a good file a good delicate filing set you can actually get some really great results I think that's the nub uh, so this needs to go like like that into the yon hole here like the actual see sits on the end maybe you can see all this i hope i'm not doing anything off camera that goes in there a couple of little touch of the glue just the tiniest amount just to lock it in there we go nice and shiny nice and shiny lovely Quano Man says, I'm pretty sure the key to successfully getting off the sprue and onto the model is inventing a, inventorizing a new swear word so depraved it would make Satan vomit. He probably is. Uh, it's, it's tubing like that is the reason I don't build car models and stick to armor and gumpla. Yeah. Once you get the hang of them, they're all right. And if you're building a car and it's things like the exhaust and stuff underneath, then all you do is, if it snaps, you put it all in place anyway, glue it together with a bit of a glimp in the middle, and then just cover it in weathering and mud. Done. <laughs> right. Now this is where the sadness comes in. This is where... Uh, you what? This will go wrong now. This will just go horribly wrong. Yeah. See, I can't get these parts off with a knife because they sit above the surface and it's it's bending. I don't want to bend anything. So I want part 20, which is, of course, this big, massive, long one I mentioned earlier on. Do oh, thanks, Obama. So let's go for the God hands. I don't predict any happiness here. I, I think something will snap at some point. But again, remember, we'll take the center point first because that's where the, the wiggly wigglies will happen and make things go bad. We want to make sure this pipe bends as little as possible. With uh, with delicate fine nippers, you want to make sure you use the. Don't go for the tips of the nippers. Never use the tips. Always use the the bit down the bottom. Whew. Let's just risk it for a biscuit. Gently, 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 gently. There we go. See how it flexed and bent a bit. You've got some flex, but not too much. Now we've got the same situation here. Got a bit in the middle there as well. So let's see if we can catch this bit first. Again, gently. Oh, yes. I'm trying to cut the thing, but without actually bending it as much as possible. As little as possible, I can bend it. But now that's freed from the center part, I can do this bit here. Which might be better if I do it that way. Maybe. No. I'm trying to... I'm having difficulty holding the sprue, because everywhere I put my hand, there's another little wibbly-wobbly tube that I'm just going to snap if I'm not careful. So, Oh, that was bendy, that was. Right. If you, if you wonder I'm going so slowly, it's because I'm trying to figure out where I can hold actually hold the sprue. Take this one here and gently, gently. Oh, that was bending there. I didn't like that. And then the last one here will actually hold the hold the tube in place, which is probably also a good idea. And snip. There we go. Woo! And I've only got about 300 more of them to go. There's a lot of these tube parts. Trust me, there's a lot of them. If I'm lucky, they'll all come off without any problems, but yeah, <laughs> if I'm lucky. So who's setting up a book and giving odds on snappage? Yeah, I'll take I'll take good odds on that. I'll admit that action. Talking about the build order, would you prime sub-assemblies or the whole thing once together? Uh, my plan is to, if it was a fine moulds falcon, here's the difference. If it was a fine moulds falcon, I'll build everything. But the cockpit just goes in and out because on the on the fine mods Falcon, uh, you've got the cockpit tube and the cockpit goes like that. So you can take the cockpit off, paint everything else, build everything first. You have to paint the interior engine parts first and mask those off because you don't want to get them you know, body colored. With this one, it's a bit more tricky. Uh, I will have probably depending on I mean, I need to see it all together, but I'll probably um, if I can, I'd have the entire hull built, all of it completely, upper, lower, mandibles, everything. And again, I will pre-paint the interior parts for the engine, like the the, the 
the square things and the grill and put them in place because it's a simple matter then of just building all that put some masking tape over that grill part so it doesn't get repainted and then just paint the rest of it that is the easiest way in. and then you've got of course the cockpit tube <coughs> and then the uh, cockpit interior first thing i'll paint will be the cockpit interior <coughs> excuse me but the difficulty with this one is to get the cockpit in you have to take the cockpit tube apart it's not like the fine mods one where you can slide in and out so there's some shenanigans to go on with the cockpit tube so i have to paint the cockpit first then assemble the cockpit tube around it there's some filling to do on the cockpit tube some seam like mold remo uh, gap removal uh, then it'll be a case of attach the cockpit frame with masking tape already on the inside to protect the interior paint the whole thing and then you can take the masking tape off and you've done it so I've, I've kind of formulated a way to do it but i need to get everything else assembled just so i can figure it out and see for myself if it was a fine mods one i would tell you exactly how i'm going to do it because I'd, I'd know exactly how to do it but this one i've not built one of these yet before so it's a trickle but that is the beauty of the falcon the majority of it oh there's a massive great knob there how am I going to get rid of that? I don't know. Uh, yeah, the majority of the, the Fire Mods Falcon is great. You can build the majority of it all in one go. And that's why I said earlier on, the beauty of this ship is that for most of the kits around here, uh, it's a real, it's a, it can be a complicated build, but a real simple paint job. Uh, I think I'm lucky in that I don't have any major nubbage apart from that one. No, no, there's one there. There we go. Little doozy right here. I'm gonna have to, there's no way for me to hold this without it bending, so I'm just going to have to be careful. <clears throat> it's right there, but I can't really brace my hand, so I'm just going to have to brace it from this end and be very, very gentle. Sometimes it's about stopping it bending and sometimes it's about allowing it to bend and wiggle a little bit. If I tried this with a knife, I know that knife could catch and cause problems and I'd much rather go slowly with a file in one direction. Uh, and Oh, Ted uh, says he's been summoned from below. He'll be back later. See you later, Ted. Hello, Mama Fox. Hello. So I'd much rather do, because if you see I'm doing this here, I, I don't know if you can actually see, because I'm a mile away. I'm working on this bit here. I'm bending the file around like this to keep the tube tube shaped and not flat. But because I'm working just there and I'm putting on no pressure, I'm not bending anything here. This is not being flexed up and down much. I've got my anchor point here on this little wiggly bit. <clears throat> it's hard to explain you kind of get an instinct for it you get an instinct for where you can bend and flex and where you don't want to i'm sticking to one direction only i'm going, I'm going forwards but not backwards and i'm being very very gentle it takes a while and it's not very interesting to watch but i'd rather do this slowly like an old Japanese woodcut artist carving out my ukiyo-e block key block making my mark carefully Oof. then just pile in with something and go Way! it snapped oh because if this did snap it's not the end of the world you could still put them all all the bits in place and then just glue it together and it would still seal up nicely and you wouldn't see anything <laughs> but it would be embarrassing and a pain in the bum let's be honest now there's a little tiny nub there and it's right against that big bit so what i'm going to do i'm going to use my knife for this very very carefully it's right on this solid bit so if i'm lucky i can just shave that a little bit tiny little amount it's all about just understanding it's about understanding the shape of the thing you're trimming and how you can best sand it by and minimize 
flexing and bending I can't, you can't really explain it it's just something you learn and you learn how to anticipate which bits are going to snap and which bits are going to bend and which bits are going to be stiff this is quite a tricky bit to actually file but you do you do get the hang of it eventually you learn the best way to do things like I'm trying to do it this way but it's a, it's a gonky way to do it but it's the best way to get a grip of the plastic and stop it bending there we go and it's not a quick process but like I say it's Treat it like I say, treat it like you're, you're carving a, a, a new QA key block. You're carving a a beautiful, you're carving up, there we go, you're carving, you've got some nice cherry wood and you're carving out a beautiful image uh, uh, of, a, of a lady doing the tea ceremony. And, you know, you've, you've carved out all the colour blocks for the patterns on the kimono. You carved out and you've done the key block and you've got the lady and the screens and everything else and you're just doing the hair you're doing the bit where the hair is on the forehead and you want these little tiny delicate strands of hair because you want it to blend from the hair to the face and you go in like a bull in a china shop and you've ruined the whole key block and you've got to start again or you could just take your time and get it right first time It's all about having fun and this can be quite relaxing if you if you're confident it's one of those things that if you kind of potter about and go too carefully you probably end up doing more harm than good I'm trying a little bit of shaving here if i can I'm trying to steady it between my fingers and thumb but i can feel it flexing and i don't like that yeah, it's the kind of thing that you, you need to be cautious, but you can actually do more harm by being more cautious than you need to be. Sometimes you just got to risk it for a biscuit, and that's how you get your confidence. Like here, I can anchor this here on my finger, so it can't bend. And I can just do that. I'll go quite quickly here, because I can see there's no way for this pipe to bend. The big flat bit there is nice anchor point. And there we go, that's that done. Cleaned up. Lovely jabbly. Uh, swig of coffee. Um, num, 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 num. I usually test pit a piece with awkward nubs. If I can get to the when it's in position, I glue it in place, wait for it to dry, and then file it down. Much more stable. Yeah, there is that. Um, but with these things, I wouldn't want to try and take this off again once I put it on. It's with like multiple, you know, you, yeah. Once this goes on, it's not coming off. Trust me. Because that would just be asking too much, I think, of it to not snap when I did that. Right, so this needs to go uh, here, there, and everywhere. Okay, that's very straightforward. Let me get my magical spudging tool. Where's my spudger? Right, so let's see if we can get this in gently. And it's like when you're screwing something, when you're playing, when you're assembling something, you've got screws to install it. You don't get one screw in and jam it all the way in. You have to do each screw a little bit at a time to spread the stress. Doesn't mean this won't actually snap off. It could entirely do that. Work your way slowly. I'm not pushing everything in massively all at one go. Little bit of pressure. Little bit. Because some of these might be a tight fit and I don't want to stress anything. This is probably the least interesting thing ever. I know that. That's in nicely. So we've got nothing on one. Two is firm. Three is firm. And a click from four. There we go. I've just got to get this last piece in down here. So. I might use the tweezers for this. I click on one. There we go. Perfect. Perfect. Now, if I tried to take that out again, I'd just be in sadness. So that goes into a little hole in there. That gets locked away. That gets locked in down there. Uh, 
Yeah, that gets... It would get some glue at the little attachment peg, except I can't see where that peg is. It's blended in so well, it's just vanished. Uh, I'll just run... Oh, there it is. And this is where this kit scores hands over fist points against the fine molds one because on the fine molds kit most of these pipes and tubes are just molded into the surface and it's only where they go over uh, a recess like that that you have a separate bit you glue in but then they have the big gap between the two pipes so yes <sighs> just make sure you don't sneeze <sighs> there we go right so that's that bit done what time are we on Quarter past four. Yum. Right, that's that bit. Now what I'm going to do as well, I'm neglecting to do it. I like to mark off where I've got up to. So I don't get confused and what bits I've taken off the sprue. So I've done all of those. I'm way ahead of where I was. I've done all that. Uh, done all that. Done that. Done that. That's been done. Those pieces are on. Normally what I'll do, I always forget, but I like to mark off the bits I've done as I do them. So I, don't, I know if, if I need to go back, I've missed something. If I find this part, I'm like, where's that supposed to go? I can find it. That bit's been done. That bit has been done. Right. Okay. Now we're back to not... Have we got any more? Oh, look at that. I-24. You said about I-24, didn't you? Oh, I don't think we'll be... We might have finished the stream by that point. <laughs> yeah, tactical doing things off camera. <sighs> Bandai's LEDs are okay, but better do your own. That's my plan for the Star Destroyer. Yeah, like I say, I don't do electric stuff anyway because I suck at it and I hate it. Uh, but like I said, it's a, it's a kit free model, so we don't spend our own money on these. Uh, right, so I need. Back onto the ice broom. <gasps> Not my counter. I need I-25 and I-22. I-25. I'm going to put my knife blade away. Whoop. Off camera is cheating, says EC Idaho. Well, it might take that long to get to that point. I can't help that. I-25 is there. I-25 and I... I-25 is that one. So now we've got multiple joint parts here. Now, you've got a big flat bit here that is attached to the sprue, and then the thinner. Now, now I normally say take the middle bit off first, but that bit isn't going to be that flexible because these two massive thick parts, so I'm going to take the end piece off first, so the end piece can flex. There we go. And this bit here. Now, so I've unanchored those wiggly, wiggly bits. These two bits are just hardcore fat pieces now, so I can gently very gently take that off same with this one there we go it's all about being super gentle uh an i-22 i'll put that there i-22 i-22 where's 22 uh oh there it is it's a flat bit with a wiggly bit Ooh. always with the wiggly bits so we're going to take the wiggly bit off first carefully Oh, that was stressful. Take that bit off. Now I say I, I'm always loath to use my god hands for this kind of de-sprewing, but when it comes to stuff like this, there really is no choice. I couldn't be using my Citadel cutters or my Tamiya side cutters for these because it would just smash them to pieces. I need something that's going to cut delicately, like cutting through butter. So this bit here, we have. Uh, it's a good thing is that they, if you get yourself a good pair of nippers, they also don't leave much residue behind or much crud behind when you trim them. So it's quite good when you can't see where the nub is. <laughs> it's kind of a handy thing. Can't actually see where that nub was now that it was attached, which means it's done a nice job of cleaning, of doing a clean cut. Mm -mm. Uh, so you've got the wiring done before the building says Ian uh, no well I'll, what I'll do is I'll, I will obviously 
before I assemble the whole and do all the painting, I'll have to put the lighting and stuff. But that's where I've, I'm not sure how I'm going to do it because I've never done this particular kit before. So that's what I need to... I'm, I'm doing a build now because I know there will be some stuff I can disassemble. Like I've assembled the cockpit tube, but now I can take it all apart again. So with the hull... I'll obviously start assembling the hull with the lighting in place just to see how it all goes together because then I'll be able to say right well I can assemble this now with the lighting in place or maybe I need the upper and lower hull separate to paint them I won't know till I've actually started to assemble it what I need to have in sub-assemblies you can't just look at an instruction book all is well it's, you can sometimes but it's not always the case that you can look at the instructions and get a build order and paint order straight from that you know, it might be that I, I try and put all this together and realise as I try to do stuff that I need to not assemble something and something else because if I do, I'll never get them apart again. Or I'll never be able to paint it. So it might be that I have to assemble the upper and lower hull separately. Like assemble all the lower hull with the, with the side walls, keep the lighting out and have the upper hull separate and then paint them and then assemble them. But I, I might be able to not do that. I don't know yet. It's all part of the learning experience. That's why I'm saying if it was a fire molds kit, I'd, I could tell you right at the moment I got out of the box, I'd know how I'm going to build it because I've done three of them. That wouldn't be a challenge at all. You just basically build it <laughs> and then paint it. So that goes there. Now this has got two little tubes coming off it, so I've got to be super careful. Because this is maximum wibbly wobbly time now, and I've got to kind of go with the flow now I've got two tubes here that go that way and if I sand it that way it's going to bend backwards and forwards like that if I sand it that way it's less flexible which is good for me so I can anchor that in place and sand it that way it doesn't mean it's not going to snap it just means it's less likely to snap also I can hold it better that way there we go very very gentle very gentle Not perfect. Need to go from the other side, I think. I think it's very difficult to hold it without having anything bending or flexing. Let's try it that way. I'm going to have to, I think. Actually, that way is easier because there's a big nub on the end. There's a big attachment peg that stops it moving. Cool. This one here is i can hold this bit which i think this little plastic bit in the middle looks like a horn like a if you look at a model car or a truck there's that little sort of snail shaped thing that's often like the horn the bit that the the, the you know you know the when you blow the horn in your car there's that like snail shaped bit in the engine area i think that's what this is off a tank or a truck or something i don't know what it's called I'm not a car scientist, I don't know these things. Try that way around, might be easier. There we go. Now the one thing I found when I was doing the fire moulds falcon, it was very similar to this, there's lots of little tiny pieces that you have to sand like this, tiny tubes and pipes. And although it was kind of stressful, because they're all little tiny tubes and pipes, um, it was also kind of relaxing in a way. Because once you get you once you get into the, into the routine of it, and that you get the feel for it, it actually becomes quite relaxing. Because you basically figure it out. Right, that's there. I think that'll be good to go. Let's get this on. Let's get it on. So this goes somewhere this goes like eh. how does this go this goes like that that goes in there that goes in there where's my spudger it's spudging time gently push that in let's click on one Two. 
two is in. Three. Give me resistance. Tweezer time. This one I think is going to snap. This one is going to give me nonsense. I would recommend perhaps doing this top piece first. It's too late for me now. Can't go back now. There we go. It's in. Click on three. There we go. <gasps> Perfect. Everything in and home free. There we go. Lovely jubbly. Bit glue there. There we go. Add a little bit of glue on this bit here. Which I'm sure is the horn off a truck. I could be wrong, but in my mind it makes perfect sense. There we go. Push that bit in, push that bit in, push that in. Fox, when you connect the LEDs to the main control box, you need to be very careful if you disconnect them because the plastical parts on the control are pull apart really easily. Yes. Oh, so if Ian Thompson says, sorry, I was talking to Quantum Man. Okay. Uh, yes, I'll have a look at that. I'll keep an eye on that then. Is this because they are delicate? That, or was it, was, just, was it just you being ham-fisted? Because it's an entire possibility. Uh, right, that's that bit on. Uh, now we have this piece here. Which uh, goes like this this attaches here the real frustrating thing is when you do a kit like this is when you spend all that time getting the little tiny piece off you know very delicately and then just when you're handling it you, you ding it and snap something off just in the process of handling it and you're like oh uh, fudge not in the process of cleaning it or trimming it just in the process of actually just handling it that can be quite saddening sometimes. I've got another situation here where this is another tiny part, a really small hole, which I may have to widen. I think. Oh no, that's in. Okay, this one. You've got the square piece. I'm off camera. Square piece with the thread with the dangly bit, and then yeah, just try and put that bit in first. Should have maybe widened those holes a bit. There we go. Click on two. There we go. Perfect. What I'm seeing here is if I've got, say, an object and a, a thin piece and a, a peg on this end to attach that bit first rather than get this in and then have to move this around. That seems to be the more prudent method, which I will gladly accept that information. A little bit of glue and a little bit of glue. How do you do? I'm a little bit of you. They are delicate and I'm a moron. This is one of mine. Yeah, aren't we all? Kind of off topic, but still Star Wars. The technical stuff from Citadel, as in snow, best way to apply it to the attack base. You mean the Valhalla Blizzard? Um, it's... It's all right. Okay, honesty time. It's all right if you're making a miniature figure and it's a small amount on the base. It looks okay. If you're doing an actual snow diorama, it's not as convincing as you might think. Uh, now, there's a million different ways to do snow. I am by no means an expert. <laughs> And not that I like to actually encourage you to go and watch things on my channel when I'm doing this free models. But uh, if you go to my channel later on, I did build the space uh, space. I did build the Space Wolves Storm Wolf. And part of that build was I did a snow effect on the base. This bit's just sticking out a bit, so I'm just going to tape it down for a minute so it can glue in place. I did a snow effect on the base uh, using 
PVA and some snow terrain snow powder. So I'll maybe have a look at that to give you an idea. It's all right, Valhalla and Blizzard. It's not bad. It's just it's not it's not the best looking kind of snow effect you can you're gonna get. There's much better snow effects out there. Uh, have a look in the e-model store. Some of the the AK stuff and the Viejo stuff is actually quite good. If you want it to look really cool, especially for an attack, which is gonna be a big a big diorama. Um, Valhalla and Blizzard. It's a bit like it works on a mini when your figure's that big. It doesn't work on a thing where the person's that big, but your blob of snow is about twice the size. It doesn't really work. It's a scale thing. Do do do. Ian Thompson. Hey everyone. Have you built something? You said hi, but you've been in the chat for ages. Um, have you built something this complicated successfully, only to have it knocked off, broken by a pet, child, or sibling? Uh, no. When I was a kid, and I don't know why, when I was a kid, my dad went to a neighbour, sort of family friend. And that's got a bit messy though, I have to sand that down a bit. And got them to build for me, and I was in like seven, build for me a model of the Cutty Sark. The classic mo uh, Cutty Sark model kit. I don't know why, this is in the 80s, I don't know why. 70s, 80s. And that was mine, he was like, there you go, that's just... And it took him weeks and weeks to build this thing. Big, you know, model of the Cutty Sark. I was like, wow! And then one day I was playing with my Evil Knievel toy and threw it in the air and it went crunk onto the cutty sock and smashed a lot of the masts and sails and I, I picked it up and ran round to guys to the hat ran back round to the guy's house in tears i've broken it Whoa. i never saw it again it never came back and i've forgotten about it a week later but you know i never noticed the one but i got this guy to build that for i don't know why it's like i'm a seven-year-old kid and you make you get me to you give me a model of the cutty sock yeah, I never quite figured that out. I wasn't even into models at that point, really. It was very strange. Uh, next is D16, which is... Can I put this on? Yes. D16 and D2 I need. Well, that's just setting there. I've just put that on because the little bit I just added was sticking up a little bit, so I want to just glue it down and hold it in place. Uh, D16 and D2. D16, which is... That one. A diddly bomb, diddly bomb, diddly bomb, diddly bomb. D16 and D2. Uh, okay, so I have to buy a new models kit as a toil. Toll to see one of your vids. I'm happy with that. Uh, now you can go and see, go and watch one of my videos without buying through me models. Uh, but yeah, it's. It, I mean, it, I just show one way that I kind of made up out the top of my head to make some snow. But there's lots of other solutions. There are dedicated snow products and diorama snow products, like I say, from uh, AK and Viejo that e models have in stock. I basically use PVA glue and some Woodland Scenics snow powder and kind of it, but I was winging it a lot. But there's other ways to do it. It depends. It's all about scale, really. It's, it's what kind of scale you want to suggest. And if you use a snow powder that like a that's like a... It's almost like glitter, but snow coloured, and it's got big, massive flakes in it. Then it, it doesn't look into scale with something that's say one forty four scale. So it's, there's different products for different scales, really. It's kind of how you want to do it. D two, like the Valhalla Blizzard is really it. It looks all right when it's at heroic scale, which is you know Games Workshop size. When it's got like a a, a dude stuck next to it. Because it looks like snow kind of looks when you're that small from that distance. But if you were doing it at 144 scale, it would look silly, basically. Oops. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, this piece here, I don't know what it is. <clears throat> but it looks just like the radios in Fallout 3 and 4. The little tabletop radios that you see. Looks like one of them. I can do a bit of sanding on this because it's a little wibbly wobbly. There we go. But yeah, you don't have to buy things from e models to go to my channel. Just go to my channel and watch it. If you go to my channel, uh, which is of course Model Making Guru, don't do it now, do it after the show. But if, if you go to my channel, <clears throat> you don't even need to subscribe. Just go to my channel, click on playlists, because unlike a lot of YouTubers, I put all my stuff in playlists. So you can find all the episodes in the series. Click on playlists 
Uh, and there's one that says it's Storm, Storm Wolves Storm Fang, I think it is, or Storm Wolf Storm Wolf, something like that. <clears throat> and the, uh, most of the episodes are building the Storm Fang Storm Wolf thing itself. That's come off now, anyway. Uh, but the last two, I think, are doing the diorama for the base. So you don't have to, you know, you're not, you're not, um, I can't get this tape off now. Where's my scissors? You don't have to buy things from your models to watch my stuff. <coughs> Excuse me, I've got really froggy throat. I do apologise for the coffee, coffee stuff. Mmm, coffee. Right, a little bit of splunge on that. I need to just smooth that down with the glue because I've got a little bit of a mess where the glue splooged out. So I'll just clean that down a bit. There we go. Bit of a rough texture there where it caught with the tape, but I can just uh, simply reactivate the glue and that'll hold it in place. Cool. Uh, we have D16, which is that one. Which goes uh, here, there. Which way does it goes that way? Cy si Reynolds says the AK snow effects is ace. I think Ted used that as well. Yes, I've heard I've heard good things about the AK. Oh, hello. About the AK weathering stuff. But again, it does come down to scale. Some things will give a nice grainy snow effect, which is brilliant if you're doing figure modeling or say 135th, but that there's no guarantee that particular product with its level of grain would work at say 144th scale. At 144th scale, snow tends to just be white shapes rather than actual textured. You wouldn't see individual, you know, flurries and lumps and bumps. You just see like smooth undulating well, you're not necessarily, you're not necessarily all the time, but you'd be less like you wouldn't see individual like texture to it really, not as much. Uh, where are we? That's on there. D two is the next one, and that goes in in there. More tweezer time. Oh no! Come back. Can I grab that bit? Yes, yes. Handy small recess center detail. Now, there's no reason at all that couldn't have been molded in, but they didn't mold it in and they gave you a bit that you can actually attach yourself. I love that. Little tiny greeble that has no reason at all to be separated, but they, they separated it. Perfect. There's even little bits here that you won't be able to see on camera, but there's like two little boxes there, two little square boxes. And coming out the back of that, there's like wiring looms, and you can see the detail on the wiring looms. It just looks like a fuse box or wiring looms coming out. It's a transformer box. Fantastic. Uh, what else can I identify on there? Anything? Uh, that is... Can I zoom in at all? Let's see if I can, I'll see if I can focus on it again for you. There's a bit here. Again, I don't know if you'll see it. This bit here. If you make model railways, I don't know what the term is, but that's the bit that sits on the wheels. And then you've got the little bars that make the wheels go around. I don't know what it's called. Like that little junction box where the pistons go in. That's the, that's basically that. That's pretty easy to recognize. Like a small off a small Hornby train set, perhaps. Uh, we have, what else have we got? There's another bit of either train suspension perhaps or it could be from a, a tank obviously we've got the the engine block there got the looks like the top of an engine block here with a hole drilled in it what else have we got that's the bit i said that looked like a like a chassis like the other side of a truck you've got an exhaust engine block here it's a bit of a grill going on that looks like some sort of giant engine from something, but I don't know what. Uh, you've got the back of a tank here. Perhaps a King Tiger, maybe. The, the sort of back armour plates. Uh, that is... I think that's part of an engine block from something, but I don't know what. And that's about all I've identified myself personally. There's probably lots of other things that you guys might know. 
but there's lots of details like here for example I don't know if you'll see but all these little rivets little rivets in the in the hull plating that I didn't even know were there after building the fire molds kits little rivets that just, you wouldn't have even known were there these little rivets down there that's the first time I've ever seen those on a Falcon and I've made the fire molds like four three four times now and I'd never seen any of those loads and loads of detail that just it's you wouldn't have known was there so I love it love it love it love it love it love it right let's get let's focus back out again hold on for me I need my focus tool let me find a focus tool there's a focus tool uh, where's my focus tool there we go now when it comes to doing like the back arm at the back hole you know the back where the engines are we'll have a wild old time finding bits of Panzer fours and King Tigers and I'll see if I can find somewhere a universal greebly because there should be a universal greebly on here somewhere uh, right what's next uh, what I'll do it's coming up to quarter to quarter to five I'll get the next couple of bits done for this next step and then we'll call it a day I think uh, so we need W14 and also I23 we say hmm W14, which is two of those, which is not the D sprue, then obviously. Duh. D for Duh Fox. Uh, brain. What am I doing? W14, there we go. You know, when your brain just suddenly stops. Uh, oh, look, there's a Sherman tank suspension joint thing. <laughs> uh, to stop, stop spotting Greebles. Right, W14. Look for the number 14, Fox. There, right. Oh, God. Tiny, tiny little bits. Now, if anybody's ever built uh, the fine molds of Falcon, you'll get flashbacks to part, I think it's part A22, which is a tiny, tiny little square thing. And by God, was that a pain, a biblical pain in the butt to deal with. It was the tiniest thing in the world, and it was a right nightmare to apply. W14 looks like a fuel filler cap of something, perhaps. Uh, W14 and we want I23. So I'll just put them somewhere safe in there. I might paint that black in there so I can see me little white parts. I23, I23. I23, it was right there. Uh, do I need to know I can I think I can use my big fat big boy nippers for this one because all the anchor points are on big pieces of square goodness none of the little twiddly tubes so there and oh bendy bendy a little bit but not too much and oh that was a bit that started to I may, may have misjudged that a little bit Whoa, these are quite harsh nippers they, they kind of bend and tear rather than the other ones do so a trade-off oh, right let's get these bits cleaned up then clean your bits now lads come on clean your bits you could spend all day spotting bits I would but I, I got the restraining order so <laughs> never mind moving on right, let's get these little bits little nubs removed <clears throat> I do apologise if my head's been in shot all afternoon. I, I can have very little control of where my head goes. It's a lovely plastic, this. It's not brittle and hard like a Tamiya. And it's not made of, like, rubber like an Airfix. It's just the right consistency. It does have a downside, though, the Bandai plastic. And that is, when it comes to the weathering, you'll see how we're going to have some issues because because of their polystyrene being a very specific kind of polystyrene it's very susceptible to solvents and it can damage it so a lot of the techniques that I would use on a fine molds falcon I will not in any way be able to use on this falcon it's just not an option so I'm not fully sure yet how I'm going to weather this. I'm not fully sure. We'll figure it out. I just don't know 100% how I'm going to do it. Uh, 
Right, this is just a very quick whiz with the with the file. Just to get rid of the tiny bit where I snipped it off. You will find if you do get yourself some good nippers, like I say, get yourself a heavy duty pair of nippers like the Tamiya side cutters or something. You know, and they're just good for the grunt work. But do get yourself a nice set of Zurons or whatever else you models I've got in store. Some of the real fine ones. Uh, because you'll also find if it's a very good set of nippers, they won't leave much damage behind. So they'll allow you to get closer to the actual component you're trying to cut off the sprue. And if that happens, then you'll have much less cleanup. With the big, like the big heavy Tamiya side cutters, you have to cut basically and leave a bit of sprue on there and then tidy it up. If you've got like those God hands I've got or some of the Zoran ones, you can cut right against the part. And you have so little left, you can you can almost not have to do anything to clean it up. So it's worth investing in some good nippers. Right now we need to do some of these car alarms going off. But it's the kind of car alarm where it just blips the horn. That needs to go here, like that. Sits in there, and that sits in there. I don't want to bend anything, but I also don't know how tight these are going to go in. So I've got to try and gently invite them to enter the little holes. There we go. Ping, ping. It's a nightmare when you've got one peg that goes in really loosely and one peg that's really tight and you've got to like a dangly tube between them. It's like, oh, I don't want to stress it. Right, there we go. So we'll get a bit of, a bit of goodness on there like that. Little bit of goodness. And then we have <clears throat> two W14s which are going to go there, I think. And these are tiny, they are the size of a rice. And I expect these, I do expect there'll be parts that disappear and are never found. I do not expect every single component to end up on this model kit. I would not be surprised if at some point something pings off and just disappears forever. There might be sadness at that, but it's going to happen. We should just accept it and get used to it now. Get our grieving done now and move on from that. So when it does happen, we're prepared and ready. Right, there we go. On that. Yeah, have, you, have the tweezers the white way around. It usually helps. And there, like that, can't quite get my hand around there without. There we go, perfect, perfect. That was easier than I thought. The mandible looks incredible already. It does, doesn't it? It does look rather fantabulous. I'm not even finished yet. Give that push down, push down. There we go. That's coming on pretty nicely. Cool. Right, so I've done those bits. Let us mark off on today's book what we've done. Done that, done that, done that, done that. This is also me just sort of sense checking that I've done all the bits on each step. Uh, we have done those, not done those. So we've got these two steps. And then we've got all those pipes, pipes. Uh, and that's the mandible done then. And then we've got the next mandible to do, which is exactly the same thing. Pretty much all over again. Yay. Right, I'm going to call it there. I'm going to leave it there for today. Because I need to go and have a great big wee and also go and make me dinner. But look at that, it's just fantastic. And this is just one mandible and we're not even finished yet. But this is, I mean, just looking at this, because I've not really had a chance to have a proper look at this up until, you know, doing it now. You can only look at sprues and see so much when you look at a sprue. Um, just comparing this to the fine molds kit, it's just so already vastly beyond anything on the fine molds kit. The fine molds kit has lots of nice detail, but this is just, this is just, it's insane, the amount of detail. And it's all crisp. There's not one little bit of flash. There's not one bit of soft molding. You know, effectively, if you were to 
find what that component is and what model kit that was from and go and find that model kit on the studio model and find that model kit and look at the full size component it would look exactly like that just bigger obviously it's absolutely incredible i am agog and i can't wait to get this painted up <clears throat> and it also makes you it also gives you an impressive respect for the people that made the actual filming model because there's so much going on you know we're spending all this time cutting a bit off the sprue and cleaning it up and putting it on because the instructions say to put it there imagine them they've got a sprue they cut a bit off and they can put it wherever they want and it all has to kind of gel together and make sense in a certain way it's like just it could take me it could take me a day and a half two days just to do the to have made the inside of that little you know maintenance bay that's insane and it's just sticking things on sticking bits on to a wooden and plastic box basically to make it look like a spaceship spaceship awesome anyway that's gonna do us i think uh i will leave it there <clears throat> i will see if we can do another week i'm going to carry on doing this anyway because i'm not going to stop i've got to get this done uh but if i can do another live stream i will do we'll do another one of these because i'm gonna have a lot of the building to do and it's i'd rather do this than just fill my time time lapse nonsense let's drink a coffee so stay tuned if you're not already following uh, emodels on facebook it's emodels ltd i think on facebook uh, make sure to follow on there uh, because i'll get them to post up when the, if there's gonna be another stream obviously if you're not subscribed to this this channel subscribe to this channel anyway like and subscribe hit the notification bell and make sure you choose all and that way if i do schedule another one of these uh you'll make sure you'll be, you'll be told in advance but follow them on the facebook as well because they'll post up when i'm going to do another one of these if we'll see see where we're up to next time uh, don't forget of course like i said uh, the emodels reward point scheme is now in place so make sure when you go in you register yourself on the website have an account uh, and that way every time you buy something you'll earn reward points and eventually you get enough you can stop putting them towards getting free stuff you can you can if you get enough of them you can buy yourself a kit for free it'd be awesome so go and do that uh, and make sure of course emodels.co.uk because it's your one-stop shop for all your model making needs went a bit high there didn't i anyway right i need to go for a great big week uh go and make me dinner so i shall say thank you very much for watching uh if you follow me on my channel i'll put this up on my channel a bit later on today i'll download this from here and put it on my channel as well but yes do stay tuned for more of these uh don't forget of course ted is building his titanic and maybe the, we hopefully should have some videos of that coming up soon on the e-models channels tony who appeared briefly in the chat is working on his own e-models build as well he's working on that rifle pans of uh, house of g that i i was going to do that i've given to him he's also got a helicopter that he's doing for us uh and colin of course is working on his ball colin's ball tank so keep your eyes open for upcoming videos and our, our build series. And of course, we'll be back next Monday with the Models Monday anyway. So until next time, I shall say, take care of yourselves. Go and do something awesome like this. Go be awesome. And I shall say, I've got, I've, I haven't got my buttons, by the way. I've only got like, I, I can't press buttons and stuff. So I'm a little bit less organized, a bit clunky today. So take care of yourselves. Go make something awesome. Adios, amoebas.